Assalamu alaikum everyone. This is the full podcast with Mama Hijab and Snicker. Not with me, you know. I'm just sharing with you. And yeah, this is the final day, I think, of Ramadan. After tomorrow, then we'll get Eid. Eid al Fitr, bro. I'm very upset for that. It will be my worst day in my life. Because Ramadan will end. Ooh, bro, Shaitan will release. Okay, so let's let's watch it, bro. Let's watch it. We have Muhammad Ajab back. Bro. How you doing? You're in here? Medina. It, you just came straight from Mecca. I saw everyone's posting yeah. the videos online. It's the most crowded. It's like 3 million people in that city right now. Absolutely, bro. It's very difficult even just to get to the restaurant. Anywhere you want to get, you know, you have to hustle, you have to fight, you know, it's, uh, but it, everyone is there for a mission. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those experiences where that you really feel like de-individualized, like you feel like there's something greater than you that you're doing. Do you know what I mean? It's, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, or what money you have, or what background or status you think you have. When you're there, it's, it's indiscriminate. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, they don't get, I mean, people don't care about that. You're there to do it you know the rituals and stuff like that and so it's a humbling experience but it's also a very powerful experience was it like was it okay on your feet like i saw were you able to do umrah and and get by and i was you know i I don't know what it is but i feel like with anything long distance i find it difficult because umrah for me like i've got my my ring it tells me like uh, this is called an aura ring so it tells you aura ring like a-u-r-a o-u-r-a okay yeah so it tells me like the steps of my sleeping and everything like that um, and so what it told me is that with the Amra, it was about eight to nine miles, okay, of that, the approximation of eight miles, nine miles of walking, plus, um, yeah, about nine miles of walking, uh, 13, 15,000 steps, I, I don't know what it was, and it took me about two and a half hours to complete. Um, and bumping into shoulders with everybody. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... Wheelchairs it over your feet. For me, I, can't, I find anything long distance, whether it's long distance walking, running... I'm not going to lie to anyone, I find it difficult. Uh, some people that are lighter will find it more easy. Mm-hmm. Like people that I speak to that way less, they find it like a breeze, nothing. But for me, it hurts my back, it hurts my feet. It's, a, it's You're grinding, you know, in these kinds of experiences. And then how, how did you get over here? You drove here today? I don't know why you did that. Was, what, how long was the drive? Like seven hours? It was about four hours. No, no, it was about four hours. I just, I know there's the bullet train, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's just, uh, sometimes I prefer being in a car, you know. I understand. And I, everybody, uh, people online are saying that this, there's something special about this Ramadan. Would you agree? Like, mm-hmm. is it, I don't know, maybe it's my first one, but mm-hmm. it seems like um, it's, it has it been more packed than it usually is. I haven't come here before in Ramadan. I've, come, I've done two hajjs before on five umrahs. Um, I haven't ever come in Ramadan. The hajj is actually more crowded. It is. Okay. Yeah, it's more crowded. Uh, but this, for a non hajj time, it was it was almost comparable with Hajj, um, but uh, in terms of the crowding, it's uh, it's almost it's frightening. It's scary. In fact, if someone's never been in a situation like that, for example, Westerners, if they're watching this, and they'd be they'd go to things like a football match, a soccer match, a football match, or, or even a festival, or a festival, or rolling. Loud. Yeah, and what we're we gonna say in that situation, maximum two hundred thousand people would come, even mm-hmm. for a World Cup final. What we're we saying, two three hundred thousand people. So. To, to have a place where there's a million, two million, three million people. Three million in Mecca. Yeah. And, and you have to organize that, you know. It's, it's not easy at all. Mm-hmm. It's not easy at all. Man. It was so packed yesterday for Tarawi that I couldn't even, like, it was, the people were lined up all the way to my hotel. Yeah. I didn't even, I, so I just woke up, I walked downstairs uh, after I made wudu, and then people were just praying in the lobby. And I ran into Muhammad, where I have a guy filming behind the camera. His little brother was there praying next to me, like, I think, how old is he, 12? Yeah. 10, he's 10 years old. It's just been, it was 33 minutes straight. It was a long, I have to admit, you, you seem tired, uh, but I, I'm very, exhausted. Yeah, very. The sleep I'm schedule's very brutal. Yeah. Um, the, it, I don't know. Like, I don't want to be complaining too much, but it's just like, it's, it's just sleep, pray, sleep, pray. Mm. It goes Tarawi, then Qiyam, then Fajr. Then, Especially if you did your Amr whilst you were fasting. Yeah. Because that can be difficult. Did, is that what you did? Yeah, I've done that. It was, it was a difficult day of fasting for me. Very difficult. But, um, one thing which was inspirational was seeing people like I've seen people that almost cripple, like handicapped, disabled. I, I saw a man hunched down, and he's doing the umrah as well. 
Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Like the resolve that he must have had. So How old was he? Like, you know? I would say about 80. Um, like maybe minimum 70 up to 85, that kind of age range. And he was crippled. And you see that all the time. People like disabled, people that are in a bad position, but they still manage to do it. And they still want to do it. It's the motivation that puts them through it. And there's something about religious motivation that gets us to do things that we would otherwise not ever do. Like I would never fast 30 days consecutively. I would not eat or drink or have intercourse or anything like that for 30 days consecutively in a time period designated. I wouldn't do that unless there was a religious incentive. And so the religious incentive is powerful. Let alone do that and then, you know, do Umrah and then, you know, pray all this uh, tarawih and all those kind of things. It's very difficult. And it's mentally draining. That's something I didn't really understand before becoming Muslim mm -hmm. was that standing there, especially for 33 minutes last night, just listen. And he started crying. The reciter was, I don't know if you saw the videos, but he was getting really passionate because yeah. uh, if I'm not misunderstood, that's when they're finishing the Quran. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I was there actually when it was so packed. Uh, well, I was talking about Medina here. Oh, is he doing the same yeah. thing in Medina? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had, we had Sudais in there. Uh, very famous Qari, very famous guy that, you know, he was crying as well. He's reciting Khatm Quran as well, the same thing, finishing the Quran. Mm -hmm. And what was powerful was that they, he did actually make du'a for Palestine uh, multiple times. And when he did that, everyone was roaring, like, I mean, I mean, like, everyone, this is, is in everyone's mind, you know, mm -hmm. and crying and stuff like that, which shows you that the Palestinian case is still in, deeply entrenched in the hearts of the Muslims all around the world. All around the world. But I, I didn't understand like how draining and like having to focus there and mm -hmm. just like make du'a and think about like your family, everything that you're praying for, for that long of a period of time. Something like here standing and focusing could be so mentally, like afterwards, after the 33 minutes, like I, I collapsed. Really? I literally had to like lay down on the floor. But I was looking at everybody else and everybody looked fine. I'm like, I, I have a lot to, I have a lot to get accustomed yeah, to. Exactly. Because it's good, bro. It's, it builds resilience. It, it's these kinds of experiences. You push yourself mentally and... Um, what happens is your threshold for this kind of thing increases, just like anything, anything else in life. Progressive overload. Yeah, it's exactly like that. I mean, it's, uh, I kept mentioning this before in the last uh, podcast we had, but that book, Willpower, um, when he talked about the fact that willpower can expand and stretch like a muscle. So you have to put yourself through these experiences. And there's something about um, you know, draining yourself, having a detox, you know, not being always on the phone for half an hour, even if you just like leave social media for half an hour, just focus on something completely else, um, fasting, all these kind of things, it's, it builds character and depth in character in a way I, I don't think anything else can. I definitely realized, and I didn't expect it going into Ramadan, I thought it'd be like, I was thinking of it from like the LA intermittent fasting, like, okay, it'll be good to like cleanse my body, yeah. like maybe I'll detox the toxins or whatever, yeah. but I think the number one takeaway, because this is the last day of Ramadan, correct? Yes. And then eat, so can I eat tomorrow? It's not, tomorrow you're going you're gonna to fast tomorrow. So tomorrow's fasting, last day of fasting, last okay. day of fasting. Then, um, then after that, it's Eid. But the, what's powerful is you're gonna have Eid here in Medina. You don't have Eid. You're gonna have Eid here. You're gonna do the Eid prayers here and stuff. Okay. Which is very beautiful, man. I thought it was extended one day. Like there's a someone was saying online that Eid was extended one day because something about the moon. Is that true? No, no, it's not extended. It's just like because it can either be Ramadan can either be 29 days or 30 days. Depending on the moon. Yeah, depending on the sighting of the moon. So they, they looked at it today to see if the moon is going to be, it's going to show for Eid, the, 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 the moon. And they, they looked at it and it's not the case. So it's going to be after tomorrow. So tomorrow is the last day of Ramadan. Okay. So effectively Maghrib, okay, is when Eid will start. Maghrib, the, the, the last prayer. Tomorrow like 5.30. Officially 6.30, you know, officially that's in this country. But officially that's when Eid will start. And, were, and then I could eat. You can eat, and in fact, it's haram not to, because on really? okay. the day of Eid, you cannot fast. You're not allowed to fast on Eid day. Really? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. And I want to fix that, but I would say the number one, I was thinking of it like from the health benefits and stuff like that, mm -hmm. like maybe I'm going to, I'll feel like a superhero afterwards. I think the number one takeaway has just been patience. Like that health-wise, I'm not really sure what the benefits were, but, you of know. Fasting. Of every, of like everything, of uh, the schedule, mm. of the patience, mm. of being around these people, of seeing the way that people are able to focus um, having to like, comp like I'm a very short tempered person. Yes. I think because the, a lot of it has to do with social media, the fact that like everything is instantaneous. And so then having to wait in line when there's 30 people exactly. or being in a country here, like where if the police tell you to do something, you're not going to argue with the cops like I do in New York. You're just, okay, mm. this is how it is. Mm. Over the hotel receptionist has taken a long time. Just, 
Just if, I, if we were in Mecca um, two weeks ago and they're taking they're taking an hour to get me the room. Exactly, yeah. You're not going to complain. Like in the United States, you might have an argument, ask for the manager, have mm. a Karen moment, mm. but it's just patience, okay? And hopefully, actually, I think that I that did help me learn a lot of that. Um, hopefully, I, I got some mental resilience from there. It's true, but sometimes they can take it too far as well. Let's be honest. <laughs> These guys here. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and I've had my fair share of uh, problems here as well. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the issues. Because everyone is frustrated. Everyone is hungry. Everyone is tired. And, and there's like, to get food here, like I say, it, this, this is, is Medina, it's yeah. hard. In Mecca, it was a mission, bro. Like, to get a burger, <laughs> I was standing there. But I was sitting down like a, like a homeless man. People were coming because I, I had the ticket and I had to just wait. And I just said, oh, I'm not going to wait. I'm, I'm going to preserve my energy for Tarawih. Yeah. So I just sat down. Yeah. You know, and I think people thought I was homeless. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought this is how it feels like, you know, to be to be in this position. Yeah, uh, same thing too. We were praying yesterday. Uh, I think it was after Fajr, and I was just trying. Oh no, it was right before Fajr. It was, um, it was called Sahur, yeah. and I was drinking an orange juice and like having a um, a cookie or whatever. And there was just nowhere to sit, so I just sat on the street, and the cars are going by, yeah. and then I'm like sitting on the road like a homeless guy. But then the, like the weird dichotomy, like sitting there like homeless. Like with the rappers everywhere yeah, and then yeah. people asking for pictures. It's like, leave me alone for one second. Yeah, like, this yeah, is not exactly. how I want to be seen. <laughs> exactly. I'm hunched over, like yeah. eating like a gorilla. Yeah, and yeah. then people want to take some. Uh, how do you manage that? Because it's like, um, he was telling me too, Muhammad was saying like, yo, you're like famous here. But like, I come here to, to, in Medina to just kind of like get the peace aspect and to, to focus. And I put my phone down. I go to the mosque to just read Quran alone. And then... There's like oh, there's always like a lot of people. How are you? Right. How do you manage that? I that's that's part of the life now. I'm afraid to, to say. I mean, once you're this famous, I mean, even I, you know, I get it. I get it quite a lot actually. Coming here, I had to take a few pictures. I don't know how many people had to stop and take pictures of me. It's it's, it's kind of um, what I would what I usually do is go to places where the, I know that my demographic are not there. So I know where that is. You know, sometimes in the UK, I know where that is. It's usually the areas which are, uh, there are some areas which, like the elderly people go to, you know, over the 65s, certain times and stuff like that, certain parks, certain places. Same thing with here. There are some countries that are not familiar with your content. So if you know that, okay, these guys are staying in these hotels. So I'd go to that hotel there. Because, mm -hmm. and this, like, for example, this area here, I know there's a lot of people that are going to be, like English speaking. Someone knocked on my well, hotel room speaking. door to try to get a picture. Yeah. He woke me up like he woke up Warner because oh, he thought Warner that's, was my room. That's very inconsiderate to be honest. Yeah, he was 15, but you know. Yeah, but even then, I mean, it's... It's still very inconsiderate. Yeah, that's yeah. very, very inconsiderate. I mean, I'm very surprised by that. But things like that, you know, if you go to a place where you know they're not there, sometimes I can help. But otherwise, it's, it's, it, is a bit of a, it is a bit of a juxtaposition because on the one hand, you're living the, the hard life. You know, you're going back to a humble kind of life. Everyone here is living that life. Everyone. But on the other hand, you, you still are a celebrity. So that you have to kind of deal with both at the same time. You could probably wear a disguise. I saw Islam Makachev with, hey, he had giant sunglasses and a hood here. and a scarf. Yeah, the picture of Medina. It's like, oh, it, it makes a lot of I wouldn't recognize him. I saw it, the way he took the picture with the hood and the glasses. There's no way I would recognize him if you walk right by me. Oh, really? So maybe, but it's so hot. It'd, it'd be hard to, to do that. <laughs> is, um, he, is he doing Amara now? I don't know. I saw a picture of him in Medina two days ago. Oh, is it? You, yeah. you were with him, no? No, no, no. With Islam? Islam, yeah. No, I met him back in Las Vegas, but oh, I, I didn't meet him here. Yeah, I made I him in Shaitan. I saw that on, some, on Twitter or something. Yeah. I met him at a casino and he said, uh, get out of this place, brother. Like, you can't be here, brother. I was there. It was uh, a UFC event or something like oh, that. Oh, okay. Fine, yeah. fine. But he's, yeah, he and Khabib come here quite often. Yeah. Actually. Um, a, a lot of guys, I just see them. And that, that's a good testament to their kind of character, actually. Because you, you'd have to put on the two. Everyone, doesn't matter what you're making, you have to put on the same two garments that you'd wear if you're actually going to die. Because if, you, if, you, if you're, if you're going to die in Islam, you have to put on these two garments. The two then, towels. The two towels. You know, uh, the Rida and the Izar. And then you'd, have, then you'd be buried in those two garments. And so in a way, Hajj is a bit like a reenactment of the Day of Judgment. Because the Day of Judgment, everyone's going to be raised up in this way. And so, it doesn't matter who you are and what you're doing. You're going through the same motions. You're going through the same experience. There's no fast track for this. I mean, I've only seen it with the very, very high elites where they have like a whole posse around them. And then, they, you know, like, for example, royalty and so, and so on. But apart from that, even the most famous people, they have to go through the same crowding and the difficulties and all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good, bro, because at the end of the day, like, we can easily become um, very, very entitled. 
and that can drive us. And then when we have that level of entitlement, it become, can become delusional. We think we're owed things that we're not actually owed. We can, we can start people, treating people with a bit of disrespect. We lose the humility, a good character. And so being in places like this, it reminds us a bit of the rough life. The Andrew Tate experience is a good example of this. Because the Andrew Tate experience is like, look, look how he was living, yeah? Very famous, very rich, had all this money, right? Everywhere he went was, was well known. But then he went to prison. Mm -hmm. And so he had to contend with the most difficult living after, li after having lived like a king, effectively. And it's even more difficult to live like, uh, to go to prison or to live in a difficult manner after having lived like a king. Because you're used to a certain level and then you're thrown into this situation. So by putting yourself in continuous difficulty, if you ever have to go to prison, if you ever have to go to a hospital, if you ever have to be put into a strenuous position, then you've already got kind of training for that. You're already accustomed, you're pretty much living like a prisoner already. Yeah, you need to have a little bit of that in your life, you know. I, f I feel like we always need that, especially in the West. Because, you know, if you think about it, bro, the way we're living in the West, where the layman is living like the king of yesterday. A king, imagine what, mm. he was, what kind of service he would get. He would get people coming, giving him grapes, anything he wanted to get straight away. Uber Eats instantaneous. Now all the kind of things that a king would have. Yeah. So in order to really to strengthen ourselves and to give ourselves that resilience and that, actually, if these positions do arise, then to put ourselves in these kind of positions is, is very powerful. In fact, that's why a lot of Western people are moving to stoicism which is this philosophy, yeah. it's called Stoicism, which basically is the idea that you're not in control of anything, and, and also asceticism, the idea of divorcing yourself from the world. A lot of Westerners like to go to, um, for example, China or India or anywhere else and indulge in Eastern meditative practices, you know, meditation, these kind of things. They restrict themselves intentionally. Yeah, because they realize that overindulgence in the living that they're used to is actually destroying them. Mm -hmm. But with it, that isn't, once again, there's not really a, an ob obligation for them to do that. And it's, it's not moving towards a particular objective and, and true purpose. In Islam, there's an obligation and it's connected to a true purpose. Right. So everything, and you cannot compare. And I would, if anyone has been here in Mecca Medina, and I've done anything else in the world, in any other religious practice, you cannot compare the two. The seriousness, the amount of people, the dedication, the hours, the actual practice... Nothing compares to the religious practice of Islam, if we're being honest. No, I haven't ever experienced anything like this in my life. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been brutal. Everyone is serious about it, dead yeah. serious. Whether you're a child, whether you're an old person, whether you're somewhere in the middle, whether you're you know, able or disabled, whatever it may be. Right. Everyone is serious. Yeah, during the prayer yesterday, I was like, I was struggling. I was like mentally, like, I got to do this. I was like, it, it, was, it was genuinely like really hard to finish the 33 minute prayer. Yeah. And then I saw his brother, the 10 year old, reciting the Quran in time. Uh, with the reciter and he was there doing it he had to sit down for a couple of seconds but he was like he was locked in i'm like how am i having to struggle when somebody half less than half my age is able to do this and then just remember, that helped me stay back in the mode and realize that uh and even yesterday like sitting in the majah reading quran seeing like five-year-old kids reciting quran like while they're reading it like better than than i could in, in years and it's it's a reminder about how seriously people take this like like you said the old men walking around but i'm curious what what, what was the I mean, you've done uh, Ramadan your whole life. Mm. What do you think this specifically, um, something that you focus on and learn the most? If mine this was, Ramadan. Yeah, this Ramadan. Do you know, like, honestly, what I, what I do is I try and make dua. I try I really think about dua is supplication. I try and supplicate for myself, for my family, for my community. And this Ramadan, which has been different, has been a lot of the dua I've been making has been about Palestine, to be honest. Sure. Like so much of it, I would say maybe 60 to 70 percent of it, genuinely, because it's um, it's something in the in the hearts and minds of everyone, and, and just seeing it, I feel like it would be selfish of me not to do that. One can really see what kind of a person you are by what kind of diet you make. So if you can, mm -hmm. if you make diet for, if you make supplication to Allah that all you want is things in this world, then you're a worldly person. Right. If you make diet only for yourself, then you're a selfish person. Mm -hmm. And if you make du'a for yourself and for the community and for people that are in pain, then that's the kind of person you are. You're a communal person. So, uh, you know, I've been trying to make more and more du'a for my family, my loved ones, the community in general, the Muslim community. I'll make a lot of du'a for them, but in particular the Palestinians. 
And I think there's something about this time round where Palestine's been attacked, which has really brought the Muslims together in a way I haven't seen before, to be honest with you, uh, coming here. I've been coming here a lot, but I have not seen the unity that I've seen this time round. The emotion on the Palestine. You can tell it's on everybody's mind. Oh, it is. It is. As soon as, as, soon as they, they mention the word Palestine, it's like everybody knows what that means. Right. And so, yes, th that's what I've been focusing on this time around. But also, I've been trying to focus a little bit more on my qualities. Like, I'm a bit of a wild card myself. I'm rough around the edges. I'm trying to work around, like, on certain qualities, so things that I want to improve on as an individual. I want to become more humble. I want to become... I want to remove my vanity and my, you know, arrogance and these kind of things and um, anything like that, any negative thing. Because, uh, you know, sometimes we focus on things we can do like prayer and fasting and stuff, but we don't focus as much on, on the virtues. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm, I'm trying to improve on that as well. Uh, that's what I, I would say that I had a similar experience. Like in the beginning, I remember I was asking you guys at Hochi Dochi in London, um, like, is it okay to ask for worldly things? And the common answer, I don't know if it was from you or from Warner, but it was like, you're supposed to ask Allah for, for everything because who else are you going to ask for? But every time I put my head to the floor and I would think about like, I mean, I was banned on Instagram during Ramadan in Mecca with Abu Tamiya during the stream. And so sometimes I'd make du'a for that, like, can I have my Instagram back? Or specific things like wealth. Um, mm -hmm. But it just, like, while I'm making du'a for that, it felt trivial. And it's like, why am I asking for these worldly things? And it, it almost seemed like a sign that I wasn't supposed to be that I could ask for something greater. Like instead of asking for my Instagram back, how about I ask for the ability to remove that need for that in my life? Mm. Why do I need that? Like I only want that so that I can make more money and so that I can bring people to my stream. Well, if people want to find that, I'll find another way. And you know, there's always, I think there's a step above a lot of the worldly things that you ask for. If you think about why you're asking for that, there's something greater that, that you could look for and show gratitude for. Um, I think that's a very mature way of thinking about things, bro. Honestly, and, and there's nothing wrong with asking for both uh, the, the Instagram and, and uh, the afterlife things and, you know, the virtuous things. But it's, it's a good way of, of thinking about things. In fact, in psychology, there's, there's this thing called trait neuroticism, um, which is, is basically when, when something goes wrong in someone's life, their ability to moderate their emotions. Basically, that's what it is. It's one of the five main emotions or five main markers that psychologists look at when they're looking at um, an individual and their makeup. So trait neuroticism is one of, the, of those things. And, um, and so if, if one, th for example, let's take your Instagram thing as an example. If something bad happens in someone's life, a person who thinks of things in a very low or primitive manner, let's say, will ask questions like, why is this happening to me? Why me? Why it was me? Mm -hmm. Why is this the case? You know? It's a victim mindset. Yeah, exactly. The victim mindset is the most primitive way and it's the most useless way mm. from a psychological perspective. The weakest potential way. It's like almost the infant uh, level of dealing with a calamity in one's life. Mm. And then you've got stage number two where someone can at least evaluate and say, okay, well, you know, it's a bad thing that happened, but maybe there's some good things that come out of it. And then the highest, the pinnacle thing is that when bad things happen to people, they think of the best possible reason, or best possible thing that, how that connects to their life. So for example, the Instagram thing is okay. The Instagram thing, they've banned me on it, but what does that actually mean? You can start thinking of it from a dunya and deen perspective and a manner. You can frame it in a narrative, which is actually favorable. So you can say to yourself, well, they've taken on my Instagram. But it's better that they've taken my, my Instagram at, say, one point whatever a million than at five point something million because it would have been more painful. Right, sure. Okay, that's one way of putting it. Or another thing is, they've taken away my Instagram, but by them taking away my Instagram, they've made me into a case study, a historical case study. I mean, they're mentioning your name in the Senate, for example. That's a pretty significant ordeal. That makes you eligible to be spoken about and written about, actually, on a historical level. Before you were just a YouTuber and a streamer. Now you're a historical figure. Now someone can, can write your name, Sneeko, and, and the case where he was removed from Instagram and Meta in the year such and such. You can be referenced. And in fact, it, you can be referenced in a way to show how these organizations and these major you know, uh, social media platforms are censoring certain things which they consider to be disfavorable to their own narrative. Another way you can think of it is, well, it's made me think of new creative ways to spread my message. Mm -hmm. 
It's made me focus more of my effort on just these other platforms. It's made me um, think about diversifying not just my social media pla- um, portfolio, but also diversifying my life portfolio. Mm-hmm. Because I realized that if it's the case that by a click of a button or decision of a decision maker, someone can take me off a platform like Instagram or YouTube or anything else, then I shouldn't allow these people to have that much control of my happiness. And therefore, I need to bring happiness from within. Right. You know, and, and that's something that the Stoics speak about. They call it the dichotomy of control, where they say that in reality, if something is not in your control, if something, you've tried everything you can within the law, within the parameters, within what's in your control. Once you've tried everything in your control and the thing still happens, you would say, okay, well, then I've tried everything I can. It's out of my control. And we would say, from a Muslim perspective, it's Qadr Allah. It is the will of Allah that that happens. And the will of Allah is always good for you. Like, even bad things that you may think are bad for you are actually good for you in the long run. There are many things maybe that happened in your life which at the time you might have thought were bad, but when you look in hindsight, think, okay, well, this happened because of this reason, and this has helped me in these ways. And so, uh, the reason why I brought this to your attention is just to show you that sometimes bad things can be good for you, but the way you frame them in your mind is what makes the difference between someone who thinks of things in a primitive, ma- primitive manner versus someone who's thinking about it in a mature manner. And b- by the way you've just framed it, it's clear that your ability to look at the world in a, in a perpetually optimistic way fits more into the more mature category, which is a good thing. And I also realize that, that there's no other outlook. There's no other way to view life. Like there's, there's no benefit in seeing it from a victim mindset exactly. or having a pessimistic view. Like how does that benefit you at all? It doesn't. The best way to go about life is to think that everything, to try to see the good in everything. And then even if things are stressful and there's more attacks from different angles, the fact that that's going to harden you and you're going to be a better person and be able to avoid that in the future. Uh, it's a part of the frustration is even someone like him, he's like, oh, I've seen your stuff everywhere. He doesn't know where I stream, mm-hmm. you know? So, but that's gonna, it's gonna make me um, a better content creator and figure out how to advertise myself in, um, also, in different tape, ways and, and how bad. to get the content out it's in a way that other content national. creators don't need to think about it because they have access to the platforms. But then once again, it seems so trivial because then, I, again, I've been making lots of dua for Palestine as well. And it's like, look, the fact that I, like even that's a struggle, you know, losing a platform when these people obviously also, we know everything that's this going on. That I think is bad. Um, My it it seems so childish, really, to to think that that's any any sort of struggle. And so I think everybody here has been. Um, I, I, I definitely can feel the the same sentiment that everybody here has been thinking about mm. about Palestine as well. Mm. Um, but. Do you think that next year it's going to be the, the same sort of attitude? Do you think that the, the amount of people here right now is because of what's happening in Palestine? Is it because it's the fastest growing religion? What's the reason that there, there's so much energy here right now? To be honest, in Ramadan, this place is known to bring a lot of people in Ramadan. It's a standard thing because, you know, in, you've got the rewards of Ramadan and then you've got the rewards of being in one of the mosques. So when you combine the rewards, you have like massive rewards and people just want to, you know, People just want to take those rewards. And you can see, it's, it's a historical thing for the last, I think, 10, 15, 20 years. It's always been packed. But as, as I say, I think the energy is different. And that energy is because of Palestine, I think. That, that energy yeah. of people are now looking, making longer dua, they are wor- working harder. I think that that, that yeah. has changed the game. Is it good? What's wrong? Huh? The battery's dead? Okay, it's fine. Thank you, sorry. Yeah, so I think from that angle, the, the Palestine thing is definitely um, a game changer from that perspective. But the, the, it's always been crowded like this. People have always been serious. And if you come and Hajj, inshallah, which is the next level up. That's in June, right? It's, it's in June, yeah. I have to look at the, the calendar. It's the Idul Hijjah. It's the month of Hajj in the Islamic calendar. It's also synchronized with the moon? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so this is uh, maybe, yeah, June sounds about right. If you, if you do a Hajj, you'll see a different level and it's even harder. The walking is more, you have to, now you, you'd have to go to a place called uh, Mina and like you, you're going to be sharing a room with like 20 or 30 other men. Oh. Yeah, and it's going to be difficult, you know, you're going to be... You have to do that? You, um, when you say you have to, it's not obligation. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a pillar of, it's not a pillar of the Hajj according to some of the schools of thought. But it is an obligation according to all of the schools of thought, apparently, uh, effectively. 
but you can stay for two days, which is the obligation in that place, or you can stay for longer, which is more the recommended action. So the Quran says, فَمَنْ تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ تَأَخَّرَ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ لِمَنْ اتَّقَى So if you stay in two days, for two days in that place, there's no problem for you. But really and truly, there's differences. Like you can, you can do a hajj, which has all the obligations inside of it, like going to Muzdalifa and going to, you know, Mina, um, spending time there doing that. Obviously, Arafah is, is a rukun. Arafah you have to do, you know. It's, just, it's just basically it's a, it's a small mountain that you go and uh, you, you make dua the whole day on there. But there are things like Muzdalifa is very interesting because it's a rocky floor, the desert. You're going to be walking in the desert and you have to sleep. I mean, you don't have to, but it's, it's sunnah to sleep in, on the floor in the desert. In the desert. Yeah, effectively it's the desert. I mean, there's, there, are, there are people that, have, that sell Coca-Cola, or maybe not Coca-Cola anymore, but drinks and, and ice cream right, and, right. oh, yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. But it's, you, you, have, you get a sleeping bag and you'll sleep on the floor, for example. And people do it. And it's very interesting because you have a very sweet sleep when you mm-hmm. do that. It's like, it's very, because you're so tired, you've been walking for such a long time. Now you're literally camping in the, on the floor in the mm-hmm. desert. And everyone, you, you're next to people that are strangers. Someone from Nigeria here, someone from Bangladesh over there, someone from Pakistan, someone from Egypt, and you're just sleeping in your sleeping bag. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's an experience and a half. Um, very interesting. And then you get your, get your head shaved off. Uh, you've done that with Amra as well. You do the same kind of thing. Do you have a shaved head right now? Yeah, yeah. I have a shaved head, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I decided to. I have yeah, to it doesn't look that bad. You know, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> And so I realized during Ramadan how the absence of something makes you appreciate having it so much more. Like the yes. way you described the sweet sleep, like getting a good night's sleep here is like a probably equivalent to what heroin is like. It's just mm-hmm. that the, the dream state that you get to be in, the appreciation you have, or like even breaking fast. I've never appreciated food more, never appreciated sleep more. Uh, I think that I, I would recommend that to everybody watching. And then also the, the, the fact of um, you were talking about good deeds and how you're you know, it's multiplied during that month and, and during this month as well as also being here. Mm. Um, it made me think about like things like charity in a different way or being kind or when someone says salam alaikum replying like greater than how they were, um, greeted you. Mm. Like with the mm. alaikum salam with more gratitude and more mm. peace behind it. Mm. Um, I haven't, I didn't think that way before and, mm. and think about it like, like good deeds in terms of currency. Um, I never really thought about Zakat, like um, in that way, and uh, do, you, do you remember the um, the charity that we were promoting back in London, uh, Project Iftar? Yeah, yeah, we broke the record of uh, of sixty thousand, and now I think we're at a hundred thousand oh, dollars right man. now for Inshallah. for people. That's really good for people in Gaza. Uh, someone had a question for you. They're, they're yeah. wondering, uh, can they do zakat online? Or does it have to be, does it require that you do it in person? So there's two kinds of zakat. There's zakat al-mal and zakat al-fitr. Yeah? So zakat al-mal is like 2.5% of your wealth. Um, and zakat al-fitr is effectively feeding for every member of your family that you're responsible for. Somebody, uh, let's say for example, the meal is worth five pounds sterling or five or six dollars. Um, for each person in, in the family, you'd, you'd have to f- pay that. Classically in the books of fiqh, uh, the books of jurisprudence, they would say that you'd have to, you know, give them the actual material. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you'd have to give them dates, or you'd have to give them barley, or you'd have to give them wheat. Now, because it's so difficult to find people, especially in the Western world, who mm-hmm. are so impoverished that you would actually have to give them dates so that they can, uh, they can consume, doing it online is the main fatwa that m- most of the scholars of Islam, they, they follow it now, or they do it. But obviously, it's much better if you could find the impoverished people in your... And it usually happens before the the, the Salat al-Eid, the, the prayer of Eid. In our case, it will be, let's say, Wednesday. Wednesday. The Salat al-Eid will be Thursday or something. So before the Salat al-Eid, that should happen. That's the Zakat al-Fitr. And Zakat al-Mal is 2.5% of your wealth. Um, that obviously has conditions and so on. It's how, how much wealth you have, which is not... I mean, you, for example, your properties are not included in that. Mm-hmm. They're not included in that. So if you have houses or property portfolio, it's like zakat evasion. No, not really, not really, because it's um, it's it's not really um, 
that's not the wealth that we're talking about. For example, if you own jewelry, right? We're not talking about money on the jewelry. We're talking about money that, if you have, if you have, for example, a business and um, the stock that you have that's left, that's left after the year has elapsed, that 2.5 percent of that, or let's say you have savings in the bank. Uh, let's say you have twenty thousand or fifty thousand or hundred thousand in the bank. You'd be, you'd have to do 2.5 percent of that. So that's zakat al-mal. Zakat al-fitr, as I mentioned, is if it's just yourself, that you're, you're, right now you're not married, it would be Muslim people that you're responsible for. So even if, you, very interestingly, the scholars say, if, for example, even if you have like a wife who's pregnant, yeah, uh, so long as the baby is over like 120 days, some say you have to pay zakat al-fitr for that. For the baby too? Yeah. So if you, children, by the way, are liable for that. But the father pays for it. Oh, so, okay, okay. So for every child that you have in the house, you pay the cattle fitter for them as well. Mm. This is the classic view. I mean, this is no controversy. So the cattle fitter is, is once a year. And uh, Islam doesn't have, by the way, taxes, taxation. Like there's no, the, in the Islamic state, there's no such thing as taxing 20%, taxing 30%. They don't tax your income. There's nothing like that in Islam. Some scholars have tried to squeeze that into the Islamic paradigm, but it's not, let's be frank and honest, there's nothing like that in Islam. There's only zakat and sadaqah. Sadaqah is giving charity. But there's no such thing as dariba. Dariba is this idea of taxation or taking 20%. Even in it. Egypt, I know that they have that in, in the UAE. and yeah, They have it all over the Muslim world, but it's not something Islamic. It's something which they've taken from the Western world. Okay. Something that the government's implemented. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not something that's it's not Islamic. Um, that's not to say that, I mean, there's a whole discussion as to is it possible to take money for taxes from people or not. I'm not getting involved in that discussion, but clearly from an Islamic perspective, there's no such thing as taxes. It's not an Islamic concept. Whether it's possible to put it on, and it's, some scholars will say no, some say this is actually a kind of theft. Why are you stealing from the money of the people like this? One of the seven uh, greatest sins in Islam is usury. Yes. So... But taxes are different, not, not necessarily usury, but it's, it's the government now taking it from the people, right? right. But in this situation, um, I'm saying that Islam doesn't really have a system of taxation. It has only a system of zakat and sadaqah, those two things. I think you, that was good da'wah for a lot of people. They, they, they might convert just because I, of that. I, I know that in the right wing, you know, this idea of small government. That's yeah. an idea, this is actually a point where we agree with uh, what you would call classical liberal, fiscal liberals on the right. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about social liberals, I'm talking about monetary liberals, the economic liberals, the ones who talk about small government. We would agree with them on that point. We would say like, really and truly, this idea of exuberant taxes and stuff like that, like especially in, in Europe, 30, 40, 50%, this is completely un-Islamic. I don't know if you saw those, um, well, I got some backlash, and by extension, you got some backlash for that, that podcast we did uh, with Ali Dawa and the Warner oh. for, um, uh, there was the one thing where I said that, like a man needs to guide his woman in order to, like a man helps his woman like come closer to Islam. And then I, all the, a lot of Muslim feminists got upset and they were saying that like more women than men are converting to Islam, they don't really need to. You mind grabbing some waters for, for yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, uh, did, did you see any of that? I, I think I saw it, but I didn't click on it. Okay. I didn't click, I, I just saw it, I said, you know, this is one of those things, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much, brother. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that. Man. Is the tea still coming? He called it in. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, make another call. So like, I, they, they could probably see we're, we're getting tired, but um, it's good. Oh, anyway, we were getting, well, I was getting backlash for saying that. Yeah, yeah. And then I explained it. I had this debate with the, with the brother, brother Adele. I don't know if you know who he is. What's his name? Uh, Adele. No. I don't know if he, he's there right now. He's doing something where you have to only stay in the Majid for. Oh, at the cafe, yes. At the cafe. So, he, yeah. so we met there and we spoke about it. He was saying how. Um, how, how important women are and, and that like a man is not supposed to uh, is not in charge all the time but do you remember do you remember when I said that on the podcast like it, it goes man um, yeah I mean people make a big thing out of nothing, uh, nothing because I do remember you saying that and it, I, I don't see it was that inflammatory to be honest I mean I, I'll be honest I, it, I was trying to decipher what you said or meant or whatever and I think Ali even challenged you on the point. He did. He, was, he, he, he said like, that more women convert than men. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not like everyone agreed on the, on the panel and everyone was like singing from the same hymn sheet and stuff. I think Ali was responding and I think he was trying to maybe politely disagree with you on some issues. Mm -hmm. But for, for why would someone be so sensitive as to find that inflammatory? 
I mean, there are contexts in which your statement could be considered to be true in the sense that, for example, a woman being guided by a man in Islam, uh, for example, a husband, right? Mm. That's something or a father. Like, or a father. Well, like, for instance, the, the hadith of the Prophet, Kullu ra'in mas'un ra'yatihi, that every shepherd is responsible for his flock and that the man is responsible for his flock and the woman is responsible for her flock. So the man is more, is more responsible than the woman because he's responsible for the woman and the children. And so there's clearly a, an added responsibility. That's not to say a woman cannot find guidance by herself. Yeah, I mean, for example, if she had the Quran and the Sunnah, she, it's, not, it's physically impossible for her to, it's logically impossible for her to find guidance. For example, there are stories in the Quran like Mary, you know, mm -hmm. she was isolated and she found guidance just through Allah. More so Pharaoh's wife, Asiya. Okay, she was Pharaoh's wife. Okay. The one who adopted Moses. Uh, yes, uh, so, so they both adopted Moses. I mean, Pharaoh himself, him, you know, um, adopted Moses uh, in a sense because he was Moses grew up according to the Quran in Pharaoh's household. But Asia was um, was praised in the Quran as a result of going against Pharaoh. You see, because Pharaoh was against her, he was, and she even made du'a to Allah. She said, "Rabbi najini min Fir'aun wa amalihi wa najini min al qawm al zalimin." That may God Nejini like save me from Pharaoh and his people and save me from the oppressive people, which are Pharaoh's people. You know, so Allah praised her because despite having all the forces against her, she was able to find guidance because she she saw. But then you could argue, well, yes, because she saw Moses, and Moses was in a sense, even though he wasn't related to her, a kind of role model for her. But nevertheless, she was. It wasn't like a father or a you know, husband guiding her. It was. In, in that story, it was uh, she found guidance through Allah mm -hmm. because she saw the prophets, who was in this case Moses and, and Aaron, and Allah praised her for it. You see, the Quran doesn't have this. I mean, if, if we did a, an honest assessment of the Quran, it's not. The, to be fair, the Quran is not sensitive to the idea of women having power. Do you know what I mean? Like, no. for example, what do you mean? let me give you an example, right? So, the, in two surahs in the Quran, chapter number twenty-seven and chapter number thirty-four. Surah, Surah Al-Naml and Surah Al-Saba, um, chapter 27 20, and 34. In both of those chapters of the Quran, a story is related of a woman called Saba. In fact, chapter 34 is named after her. Okay, And she was a queen. Okay. Now, it's really interesting because in the previous surah, in the case of... Uh, in the first surah that I mentioned, Saba was depicted... Sorry, Pharaoh was depicted as a, as a tyrant, Pharaoh, okay, in Egypt. But then Saba, who was at the same time as Solomon, uh, Solomon, or Solomon, you know, King Solomon, she's depicted as a very wise woman, and she was a queen. So, for example, the Quran, here we have a woman, okay, in the Quran, who is a queen, who is depicted in a very fair-minded, you know, wise way. She, she even sought consul, uh, consultation from her in a council as to what to do with Sol uh, Solomon, the king, and who's also a prophet according to both religions, actually, Christianity and Islam. Um, and so, for example, Solomon, uh, or Solomon, he, he threatened, uh, or he threatened Saba in the story, and then she didn't know how to respond. So she, she went to her, her, her uh, you know, council, and she asked them, you know, in uh, in the buluka. She said, no. In fact, firstly, she said, "What do you what do you advise me to do?" So they responded and said, uh, "We are uli betsin shadidin fa madha ta'murin. Tell us what to do." She says, "In the buluka, ida dakhalu qariyatan afsaduha wa jaalu aiza ta'aliha adilla wa kadalik yafalu." That truly, kings, and she was yani, in, implying Solomon, when they go into a place, they destroy it. They destroy it. And they make the people who are lofty very lowly. And they will do the same thing to us. And she goes, what I'm going to do in this story, she says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send him a, a, a hadiyah, a gift. Now she sent Solomon a gift. Solomon now is a prophet and he's a king. And Sabbath sends him a gift. As soon as he sends her, you'd think Solomon would be, you know, calm and this and that. And she said, he said, uh, 
He said, are you sending me this? Uh, why are you sending me this? He says, what, what Allah has given me is better mm. than what, you ha- what you're trying to give me. And then he said, uh, send back this letter. This is what Solomon said. He said, send back this letter. Allah ta'alu alayya wa atuni muslimin. Don't become arrogant on me and become Muslim. That's it. And if you don't, we're gonna, we're, we're going to fight you. We're going to do that. So, so basically what happened was Sabah, she went to Solomon. And she, she was invited as a queen. She looked at how they were doing. She looked at his life. She saw how they were worshipping God. And she became Muslim. So it was a happy ending for her. But she was a queen. So it's not like Islam as a religion or the narrative of the Quran we're triggered by women being in power or this and that because if this was the case why is the Quran keep telling us stories of women mm-hmm. who are in power who are positions of influence who are positions of piety and so on and so forth we have, we have, we have no issue of that the issue is where you think that a woman in a familial setting okay in particular in a familial setting should have an equal say as a man because the Quran is very clear about that no yeah, the, the Quran says, for example, in chapter 4, verse 34, That men are maintainers and protectors of women because of what Allah has given, some that He hasn't given others. Mm-hmm. You know, and Allah says in the same chapter, That do not wish what the other one has. Um, for a man mm. is a portion of what he has earned and for a woman is a portion of what she has earned. So we have this complementarity idea. It's a complementarity situation. It's not a, it's not a competition. It's a compl- it's, it's compl- it's complementarity uh, between a man and a woman. But on the point of, I mean, it depends on the context. That's why I was trying to understand from you what exactly we were trying to say. In Islam, yes, the man is given uh, you know, rights in a familial setting. He is the husband, he is the father, and he has the final say in these contexts. Um, but it could be that a woman, if, for example, let me give you an example. If a woman, she's pious and Muslim, right? And let's say she's a daughter of a man who's not in none of those things. He's not Muslim even. Then in a way, she has to take, he's relinquished his leadership. Because she has to take a kind of leadership, a spiritual leadership. Oh. And, and, and in the Quran, you're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be that a, man, a Muslim man can marry a Jewish woman or a Christian woman uh, under the, the idea that he's going to convert her once they get married. But on the reverse, a, a Muslim woman cannot marry a Jewish man yeah. or a Christian man because he's the one who's supposed to be leading spiritually. And overall, the bigger point was it's not to say that women cannot cannot be religious without the presence of a man. Yeah. The bigger point is that men should take the responsibility, and it's Sunnah, it's in the Quran, that we're the ones that are supposed to be leading, especially with those ideas in the household. And ultimately, it's our job to, to maintain those, those rules in the family. Absolutely. But, yeah, that's true. And I was wondering, because I, I got a lot of backlash, like, you know, I don't, it's the month of Ramadan, but like people are, people are getting really angry. About that? Really, really upset. What are like, they saying? Like, what's the issue? Um, I would say it was a lot of like uh, Muslim feminists, which mm. I want to get into that idea yeah. first, like how that even works. Um, but like the Muslim feminists, they were saying like, um, you know, calling me a grifter, saying that I'm a misogynist, like wishing death. Like it was, it was bad. Like, it was, um, it was pretty bad. But uh, it seems um, kind of hypocritical to me because how could you be a Muslim feminist? Because the ones that were really upset and were wishing harm upon me, I click on their profile and it's, it's all these like feminist things like, you know, the Cardi B, a lot of the oh, same yeah. ideas that we see with like um, feminist w- women in the West who are godless, they kind of, they attach those ideas to Islam. Uh, I'm wondering how can feminism and Islam coexist? Well, I mean, they can't. I mean, this is the short answer because feminism, if one wants to be integrous and actually take feminism, like let's say we were talking about second wave feminism in particular, um, where the writings and the movement and these kind of things, if you want to take that seriously, and you also want to take Islam seriously, then you can't take both seriously at the same time. Because if you want to take feminism seriously, especially in the, sec- in the 60s, second wave feminism, this idea of domestic drudgery was, was one of the top things that they were talking about. So people like Betty Friedan, people like Simone de Beauvoir, people uh, obviously... Uh, Jermaine Greer, who's still alive now, all of these were like you could you could call them the mothers of feminism. One thing united them, which was their idea of domestic drudgery, the idea that uh, in 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 the domestic environment a woman should not be cleaning, cooking, 
she, in fact, Simone de Beauvoir in one of her books, The Second Sex, which was seen as a seminal work, in fact, most universities consider it to be the most important works of the 20th century, yeah? Mm-hmm. And I've got all, I've done, you know, courses on this and I've written books on this, but the, suffice it for me to say is that she writes that the institution of motherhood itself is something to be, is something that you should try and avert. That you shouldn't even try to be a mother because it's, it's, it's exploitative, she, she says. In fact, the way she frames it is that a man is biologically oppressive to a woman. It's just like that, my biological determinism. Mm-hmm. But that, you could say, is an extreme position. What wasn't an extreme position in feminist works was the idea that a woman in the house setting uh, is considered to be an inferior and therefore should not accept that subordinate position because equality would, did, would uh, indicate that there shouldn't be uh, differentiation in roles between men and women. This is, this is the argument, effectively. And so if this is the argument that you want to make and you want to be... You want to be believe in these kinds of principles. You want to be connected with these kinds of principles. How on earth can you believe in this, but at the same time believe that the man you have to obey him? I mean, if you went to any of these women in the second wave feministic movement, even going on to black feminists like Bell Hooks and Audre Lord, because in the seventies and eighties you had this kind of black feminist movement, right? Because they said, well, we actually haven't had enough representation of black people, that, so these women came up up until Kimberly Crenshaw in 1984 where she wrote a seminal work for them because it's, it's rubbish to be honest I've read it all myself it's called and she discussed uh, what she called intersectionality yeah so that whole tradition if, if you even want to call it that well that whole corpus from the 1960s until the 1990s and beyond of feminism where we're talking about obedience is considered to be oppression patriarchal society is considered to be wrong and by that they mean the man being in any kind of power position over a woman a domestic drudgery an attack on the institution of motherhood all of these points are fundamentally and diametrically opposed to the religion of Islam to the mm. point and this is going to sound harsh where I suspect many of these Muslim feminists that the so called Muslim feminists are either apostates from the religion of Islam mm. Uh, clandestine apostates so they're hiding it surreptitiously mm-hmm. they don't actually want to because for some reason socially they don't want to um, they want to still have the label of being a Muslim but covertly you know they don't really believe because how could you read Surah Nisa how could you read for example uh, verses from the Quran which says that man you have to obey him for example the verse the verse on 434 mentions the word obedience it's in the Quran, it's not just in the Sunnah, because mm-hmm. in the Sunnah is very clear. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you have to wa'ata'at very clear, you have to uh, obey your husband. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's in the Quran, it's in the Sunnah. I believe that these Muslim feminists, they fall into two categories. Either, number one, apostates. Com- yeah, apostates from the religion of Islam, not, not true Muslims, clandestine apostates of some sorts, what you call zanadiqa, zindiq. Um, they don't represent outside here. What, what we're seeing in Mecca and Medina and these kinds of religious people yeah, in the Muslim world, they don't represent the 95%, they really don't. According to all the polls that have been done, even by Pew Research and other things, they are a loud minority of a minority of a minority. Yeah. And, yeah. and I like that you call them apostates and not like adaptive Muslims because that's how you get, uh, right now Don Lemon just got married, um, these gay guys in New York, I married the CNN reporter, yeah. uh, the marriage photos with a giant crucifix right behind his head, yeah. right? And people aren't calling them apostates of Christianity, they're just saying like, this is like new wave, there's no such thing as no, new wave some Islam. some of them are apostates and some of them are ignorant though. So some of them don't realize that, okay, you cannot have these two beliefs at the same time. Well, I'm saying, but there's no, there's not criticism from within the Christian, like, peop, generally people do not call that apostate, but there's, there's no, you can't adapt Islam. Islam is the way it is, and exactly. that's, it's not... There are some things about Islam that there's no room for interpretation in, in there, at all. And these are some things. So, you know, I wouldn't go and pronounce an individual person to be a, a, a disbeliever, because they, they could still be ignorant. Mm-hmm. And this is called al-adr bil and it's not for lay people or anybody to go out and say, okay, you're a disbeliever. Unless they come out and say, like, there's a particular woman, uh, her, her name is Amina Wadud, actually. She's, she's based in Berkeley, uh, in, 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 in not LA, uh, in Berkeley, yeah, in California, yeah? But she has a book, and she says that when she, we mentioned chapter 4, verse 34, when she read 434, she said, I had a conscientious gap and I said no. 
That's what she said. <laughs> so many people have, and I'm not saying I'm one of them, but I said, well, if you're saying no to the Quran, then you're not a Muslim. Why, why are you still wearing the headscarf? Why are you still you know, pretending to be a Muslim? So and 434 saying, is obey your husband. Yeah, because it's, it's, it says uh, lots of things in that verse, but it's the most, I would say it's the most clear verse about hierarchy in the whole Quran, but, you know, in terms of uh, men and women, husband and wife, 434. And it's also, also attacked by Orientalists and feminists and stuff like that. So she says, no. So if I'm saying, you, so you're saying no to whom? You know, saying no to Allah. So, so what, how does that make you a Muslim then? Mm. Is the question. Now, she could still be an ignorant person, even though she spent her whole life studying Islam. I don't think she is, personally. I don't think uh, that her belief is compatible with Islam. I c consider her to be a disbeliever of Islam. I would not pray behind. I would not, not let any woman of mine pray behind her or something like that that I know. Mm -hmm. So it would not happen like that. But uh, so what's know, the other one? So it's apostate. What's the second one? Ignorant. Okay. There's no third. There's no third. Uh, unfortunately, there's no third uh, category. Right. Either you're an apostate or you're ignorant. If you, if you want to say that, okay, well, um, it's about obedience and all these kind of things, I don't agree with them. Do you know what I mean? If someone is, I would say either you're an apostate or you're ignorant. There are some things, in the, like, for example, about homosexual sex. It's okay. very clear. Yeah, no, but some, some Muslim come and say, you know, um, if this is uh, okay. I say, Khalas, it's okay. It's okay for non-believers. You're not one of them now. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. It's okay with them. Right. So, because if we open the door for the khalas, the religion of Islam will become like Catholicism. Mm. But with Catholicism, there are so many things in the Catholic faith that were considered to be wrong, which are now considered to be true. Yeah. Now, I, I don't see, like, for example, you could say, well, that's because the context has changed. But some of those things are not contextual, they're theological. I'll give you an example, right? There was this whole controversy, and this is up at the time of Augustine about babies that are not baptized, that they will go to hell. I don't know if you've come across this. No, I did not know that. So there were proclamations, even Augustine mentioned this. I mean, it's a very big controversy in the, in, the, in the Catholic Church. Babies that are not baptized, they go to hell. Baby. For Muslims, I don't know baptized when you put them in the water. Put the water. Yeah. I was baptized. Yeah. So, so some scholars, I mean, in the Catholic faith, this was one of, if not the official position. And then, okay, recently the popes have come out in these declarations and so on. I said, actually, that's not the case. <laughs> but that's not something which is a context-related thing. That's a heaven and hell. So what, all these babies went to hell. These babies went to heaven now. Yeah. Because the pope changed his mind. So who's the god? Pope or you? God the god. <laughs> who's the, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the religion of Islam cannot be subject to that kind of change. It's one of the miracles and evidences for the veracity of Islam that the religion of Islam is actually preserved. Mm -hmm. It's preserved in text. It's preserved in practice. And it's preserved by the people. Mm -hmm. it's pres it is preserved. Like what you're hearing outside now is a testament to the preservation of the religion of Islam. I hope they can hear it. I really hope it's very yeah, beautiful. Yeah, uh, this is a testament to the preservation of the religion of Islam. There is no equivalent anywhere else for any other religion. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, and so that's... Once you have someone like a Muslim feminist thinking that they can come and change and corrupt the religion of Islam, I consider that to be... A disgrace, uh, an abomination. Yeah, she could be a kafir, but I'll, once again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't label her as that. Be careful of making that <laughs> yeah, yeah, feel yeah, right. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I wouldn't personally label until I've seen her spoke, and you know, and so on. But mm. it could be absolutely. It's yeah, they're very upset with me right now, and I had a back and forth with Adela that that was basically defending them, and you know, trying to get like sympathy from um, from Muslim feminists. Uh, but it was, it was pretty ironic afterwards because I'm siding with. Um, I think that men should lead, you know, that I think women should obey their husbands. And I think that like we should be the, the leaders of theology in the home. Um, and then after we had this debate, it, it went viral again, responding to that. Thank you. You could bring it here. And after he was getting praise from these Muslim feminists, one of them tweeted, oh, let's not praise Adele. He's been accused of such and such with the woman, but don't praise him. And without any evidence, uh -huh. she just accused him of, of being like, they, she said he was, he was violent towards women. Thank you so much, Saka. Um, uh, how do I pay? Um, can I put it in the room? No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'll put it in the room. Won't you? Yeah. Do you have a pen? Yes, sir. Yes. I've been drinking, that's all I drink besides water. He's saying that he was a grapist or something and yeah. didn't provide anything. And then, um, ah. the guy, after he defended the Muslim feminists, they, um, they started accusing him, saying that, oh, of nothing. They just said, they insinuating that he was a grapist or something. And yeah. didn't provide anything, and then um, 
And some of the brothers were, were messaging this girl that were putting out those accusations. Yeah. Yeah. She had no evidence. She had nothing. She and she said that we should believe women. And if yeah. women say that they were hurt or they were wrong, she's inclined to immediately believe them. So she's believing a random DM yeah. and then putting. You have to believe them under every circumstance. Believe all women. That was like one of the feminist ideologies. And it, it's I messaged him afterwards. I'm like, hey, I was right. And he said he agreed. He's like, actually, maybe you were right because she she just said that. I don't even know what she was accusing him of, but all the women believed it because I, I mean, let's be honest. Women Guilty are, until proven innocent. Women are easily manipulated, you know, Absolutely, they're yeah. very easily going to be swayed by something like that. They can be, and there's evidence of that. I mean, so the, look, I mean, especially with the emotive arguments, you know, and especially a woman who's been through something like that and, and actually been through it. Right. So because there's a lot of women out there that have actually been through traumatic experiences. I know it's a buzzword now. And to be honest, I think that this word has been abused as well. The word trauma. Mm -hmm. People throw it around. Oh, I've, they hit their head on the, the, on the wall. They say, oh, I've had a traumatic experience today. But... Um, some women have been through some very difficult things and as a result um, they can sympathize with, with false claims but what this is ironically in terms of that is when the when the evidentiary bar for such a thing becomes so low a dm it, that's yeah the bar. No, it becomes so low like it, you know it becomes so it basically he's guilty until proven innocent it becomes so low that actually trivializes the actual cases where someone has been raped or hurt or, or sexually assaulted right because let's be honest, right? There, there are those cases. Okay, let's be frank. There are those cases, yeah? Like, for instance, if any of us, we have, like, you know, I've got daughters, you know, if we have wife, whatever. If we actually witnessed someone sexually assaulting our loved ones who are women, there are some scholars like Ibn Hazm, right? One of the great Andalusian scholars in the 5th century. He says that you know the the, uh, the ayat of muharaba actually apply, which are the ayat of war. You can you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, kill him. You can. But you cannot imagine if you witness such a thing that you would you yourself wouldn't have an emotional reaction. So in fact, I don't know of anyone that can have more an emotional reaction than me if I were to witness something like that of a woman being dealt with in that manner. Uh, so, but I would require some kind of evidence. A DM is not an evidence. No, it's you know not. what I mean? Well, that, that's what women run with. These Muslim feminists, that's all they need. Mm. And all of them believed it. Like, all mm. the people that were uh, accusing me of, of being misogynist, all this, all of them, like, they flipped on Adele. And Adele was siding with them just because of one DM that mm. they didn't even read themselves, which is because one woman said it. He's going to fall on his sword. Because he's using the same, if you allow this evidentiary bar for yourself, for other people, then it will be used against you in the same way. Mm -hmm. If this is the evidence that you allow for other people, even if it's your enemy, Okay, a DM, believe a woman, all this kind of thing. One day, a woman can be have some kind of scorn against you, and she uses the same event, and you're finished. Yeah. Because well, now, you're finished. yeah, well, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because now you've said to your, you've said to the public that I accept as a genuine evidentiary bar this level. Any woman that's just giving me, you know, a DM, mm -hmm. no, I don't accept this. I'll accept it. Uh, so I, I kind of feel bad for the guy, but I mean, it, it, he did kind of prove me right. But anyway, since um, you, you have been really active on social media during Ramadan too, which uh, it's not easy. Uh, you just came back from that debate with Fresh and Fit. And I got to say that that was, that was very entertaining. I'm not going to lie. Mm. And I was asking about the love speech community before the stream, like what's some questions? Mm. Um, there was one question from a sister. She said, uh, did Paul meet Muhammad? Yeah, what, what, what's that got to do with it? I don't know. What was it? Look, the brother Fresh, um, and Myron, I think that they are ess essentially good guys. Very good guys, yeah. I think they're good well, Some guys. of my best friends. I think that these guys have... I don't even think that they were trying to... I didn't go hard on them. I didn't try to attack them or hurt them or debate them. Because I feel like they're coming from a place where they want to improve men. They're seeing the problem. The yeah. problem where men have been emasculated. They've been harmed by certain ideologies related to feminism. The, o the main thing I would say about Red Pill community is that they've gone into overcorrect mode. And sometimes an overcorrect is required, actually. Because when a pendulum swings too much this way... It goes the other way. It goes that way. And, that, and they are the manifestation of the pendulum swinging the other the way. The other way, yeah. Yeah. If you keep telling me about feminism and, and you don't require evidence for to prove a man is, is raping, a, raping another woman <laughs> yeah. and you don't need this and the woman is not... and the man is not respected and this and this and that and that. Okay. That's got to simmer in the minds of men in the West and in the East and in the, everywhere else in the world. And it's become resentment and it's going to become, you know what? We're going to start using women in this way and do this and we're going to act like that. And we understand these methods now of these women. 
these entitlement women, these modern women. And there's a lot of truth in this. There's, I cannot lie. There is so much truth that I agree with from this, from the whole movement. Mm. The reason why I brought up some issues of high value men and this and that and that <laughs> was only because I was thinking about the matter in a more logical and I would say academic manner, frankly. And I just wanted to share my ideas on that. But there are so many things that they've got right. There are many things that they've got wrong. And there are so many things that go right. They've got so much more right than the feminists. There's no doubt about that. It's not right. I mean, there's no comparison between them and the feminists. I don't allow it. But everyone gets things wrong because it's not unless you're getting it from God. There's going to be faulty. There's going to be faulty things, and we right. have to address those things. Like well. stoicism, it's adapting a lot. Bro, sorry, this video flipped horizontally, and that's why you are seeing they're eating with left hand. Okay. They're, they're eating with their right hand, okay? Don't don't be foolish about that, okay? Okay? You, you got it, bro? Okay. A lot of the traits of Islam without yeah. searching for a higher purpose. Mm. So you're just, you're doing things for the sake of doing them, but rather than to get into heaven. Mm. So yeah, it is barely necessary. And I've seen, they're getting a lot of backlash right now. I think more than I've seen, especially from the conservatives, the religious people. Mm. Um, I think as more people are starting to embrace Islam and are, are getting fed up with that. I, th I think a lot of people disagree with Myron's 50 bodies idea, saying that a, a man needs to sleep with 50 women to yeah. understand them. I think a lot of people are disagreeing with that. That's something that I publicly disagree with him quite a bit too. Yeah, yeah. I understand why he thinks that, but now I'm seeing them uh, get more backlash than ever, and uh, they are doing a lot of good. I, I think that of any men's podcast, they've saved more lives than any other podcast, and they deserve more respect. And so, we, we, I think we should stand think, by our brothers. I think we should help the brothers and not push them away because I think that these brothers have a lot of potential. And my my approach with people like Myron and my people are fresh and other people who I think really, either secretly or openly, I haven't seen much of their content to know. I actually agree with you a lot of the Islamic principles. They agree with it. They do. Especially when it comes to gender issues. I think we shouldn't be too harsh on them. Because, you know, the Islamic spirit with these things, and, I, and people even till this day, they criticize me on my public support for Andrew Tate, for my help with him. But I, I've said the same thing and I'll say it again. Even if a feminist becomes a Muslim and she has a background like this. You welcome her. I welcome her and I will help her, even if it takes years. And I believe that's what Islam is about because, for example, one of the recipients of zakat is al muallafati qulubuhum. It's mentioned in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse of the Quran, which is, there are eight recipients of zakat. One of them is people who are not Muslim yet, but they, they are people who... Their hearts are there. Yeah, their hearts are effectively there. Their hearts are, can be softened by Islam. Mm -hmm. You give them gifts, you give them... You, you treat them nicely. The idea is in Islam, people that are close to Islam, don't push them away, bring them closer. Even if, it, if, if you have to play the long game, bring them closer. And I believe, looking at the way of the seerah of the Prophet, that's how he done it. So we shouldn't be too harsh with people like Myron. Yes, there are some things about how he didn't defend the Prophet and so on. He must be spoken about. Okay, fine. But don't push him too much because, you know, he could be a great person who, like yourself or like Andrew Tate or like anybody else comes into Islam and becomes and brings so many people with him to Islam and he's already a Muslim actually Myron but I'm saying becomes more religious for example mm -hmm. so I, I don't think we should we should be pushing these people away I don't I really don't think so and I think that they, we can tweak everyone deserves to be criticized we, we've been criticized and As we are right us. now yeah, yeah we're criticized and it's good for us I believe criticism is good it hardens you and it makes you uh, shave the edges off and make sure that you it get does. to the, the true it, Otherwise, you'd be a narcissist. You're just gonna, you're yeah. gonna think. I mean, imagine receiving all praise and no criticism. What kind of a person would you be, bro? Mm -hmm. What kind of a person would I be? We'd be a narcissist. Criticism saves us, bro. It saves us from delusion. Mm -hmm. It gives us good deeds because when people criticize us uh, and it's wrong, for example, then we're beneficiaries of that on the day of judgment. It makes us stronger, you know. And so everyone needs to be criticized, including Myron, and he needs to be able to accept criticism as well, of course, because I've seen some recent video of him on Twitter, uh, you know, shouting at, you know, uh, defending Fresh, yeah, yeah. I think it was. And, and that was. It's brotherhood, that's loyalty. It's loyalty, it's brotherhood, it's all very well and good, but then, you know, I mean, I, I've also had moments where, you know, I regret and uh, maybe I went too emotional and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, they're good we, clips. I can they're great clips, but yeah. then it could be used against you because then someone's gonna say, "Why weren't you like that when it came to the profit? Why weren't you like That's that true. when it came to this and that?" That's true. And then you're gonna have to start firefighting again, right? Yeah. So what you decide to be emotional about is something which will be held against you. Mm. You know. Especially, but, yeah, I mean, as I say, I think that, that we shouldn't be too harsh on them, and they're your friends, and I think we can bring them closer. And one day, inshallah, we'll bring them here, inshallah, and let them taste what we're tasting and, and enjoy what we're enjoying. Yeah, I mean, I can tell that from, from my point of view, I can tell that the, the stress of, it's a stressful world, the content space, especially when you're speaking up for these issues, mm. getting the amount of attacks that they get, like they got demonetized, they speak about Zionism, so they're getting attacks from all these angles, and it's like the stress from, from the world, from all those attacks is like really starting to, uh, so I want to see them like, you know, find some, find some more peace, but what's your... What was your perception of um of that fresh debate, uh, especially with Christianity? It's uh, I mean basically I, I that was that specific debate, you know, wasn't um, with you and Fresh, but with uh, Sheikh Uthman in the past. That was what helped bring me to Islam. That debate about the Trinity and how three can be one. It's just something that like uh, I grew up believing as a Catholic, but it just it never made sense and it was never explained properly so having a, a muslim debate and, and like just literally thinking how can three be one yeah like it literally does not make any sense and then um i liked it was a funny argument i, I watched it back i uh, think his argument was um who created math yeah, yeah. and is like because uh, he was trying to say like man well again yeah, man technically created uh, the figures to draw numbers but the idea of math as a science it just is it's objective without uh, man did not create that it, it just is so that it was um it was to it was interesting to steal man his position at the highest level look i think he was basically saying can god make the impossible possible right because like for example two plus two equals four is it can, can 2 plus 2 equals 3 or 5? No, it's impossible. But can God do that? And what we're saying is that, I think he said it himself, when I said, can God uh, create a rock so heavy that he can't lift? And he said, the question doesn't make sense. So I was trying to make him understand, what do you mean by the question doesn't make sense? Because the idea of a rock so heavy that God can't lift is unintelligible. It doesn't make sense. It's mm. an impossibility. So it doesn't exist. And so he's trying to say like, oh, that means God's limited. But Well, in fact, like, the fact that God, uh, I think he was trying to say, um, can God die? And you're like, no, God can't die, so God's limited. Well, in fact, the fact that God can't die makes him more unlimited. Yeah. Right? That's a limit. But Death is a limitation. The, the thing is, in logic, there's a, there's a whole category of things called impossibilities. Yeah? Like, for example, a squared circle. Mm -hmm. A squared circle cannot exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. You can't even think about it. I mean, it's not something which exists. They're two opposite things. And they fulfill the criterion for contradiction, yeah? Now, because they don't exist, we cannot speak about anyone creating them. Because they don't exist. It's, it's an uh, impossible entity. It doesn't exist and it can't exist. So the idea of 2 plus 2 equals 5, it's not just that it doesn't exist. It can't exist. And God, the idea of God, can God make 2 plus 2 equals 5 is equivalent to can God make a rock so heavy that he can't lift, it's equivalent to can God cease to exist, can God kill himself, let's go further, can God lie, can God rape, can God steal, we would say these are all impossibilities, it doesn't make sense, for example on the idea of God, can God steal, how can God steal anything when he owns everything, the idea makes nothing. So it's not limitations, it's just not, it's an impossibility. These are impossibilities, yeah, these are mm -hmm. impossibilities. So I understand what, it, look, someone can attack him and say, look, he's so low IQ, he doesn't understand that uh, mathematics is something which was discovered rather than, but I think I know what he was trying to say. And it's not such a low IQ statement. Uh, he's trying to say, well, maybe God can make the impossible possible. But we're saying that if you let that happen, I mean, Aristotle, for example, Aristotle was a very famous uh, logician before mm -hmm. Christ. He wrote mm -hmm. a book called The Metaphysics. And in that book, he said that basically, if you, if you don't have the law of non-contradiction, anything can happen. There's no, we cannot even have a discussion. Like for example, the statement that he said, which is that, can God make two plus two equals five, whatever it may be, or God can do it, for God is possible. That statement itself is susceptible to self-refutation because there's no requirement for it to be coherent in a world where it's possible for contradictions to exist so it's a self-refuting point so the moment you get rid of the law of non-contradiction 
You can't even have a discussion with anybody about anything because truth doesn't need to be coherent. Mm-hmm. If, it's poss- if it's in any possible world, the case that truth doesn't need to be coherent and the law of non-contradiction can apply or 2 plus 2 equals 5 or whatever other impossible thing can happen, then you don't, there's no more a requirement for us to be coherent or cogent or make proper sense. Nonsense can make, is, is as good as common sense in that paradigm. But that is the kind of thing Christians have to resort to in order to make sense of the Trinity. But uh, as I said, I think Fresh, if he, if he just you know, opens his heart to Islam, he might become Muslim as well. I, I don't know if he's a huge figure in uh, the social media world. He is. Is he? Yeah, he's very big. So he would be a great uh, person for us to have as well. I mean, young people follow him and stuff like that. He's a fantastic guy. Do we have some more questions? Some of them are silly. Yeah. Um, uh, Parham says, would Muhammad Ajab prefer to fight 100 chicken-sized Ben Shapiros or one elephant-sized Rabbi Shmuley? One uh, uh, Shmuley, because <laughs> the elephant I can run away from. I can run around him. Right, right. Those 100 chickens are going to kill me. Mm-hmm. They're, they're too fast. Right. Now, the elephant is fast as well. But I just have to avoid one. And you can crawl underneath? Yeah, yeah. I, I'd rather go for the elephant. It's one target. That was a quick answer. It seems like you, th- you thought about that before. No, I can uh, circumnavigate them. I can't circumnavigate a hundred uh, things. Well, ten of them could kill me. DGM says, if I get a girl pregnant from Zena, do I have to look after the baby? The answer is yes, right? There's no abortion is, um, is a major sin. The question is... If I get a girl pregnant yeah. from Zena, do I have to look after so the baby? So sc- scholars of Islam would not attribute this baby to him. Really? Yeah, they wouldn't. Now, that's what scholars of Islam would say, like from a lineage perspective, because kids that are born outside of the uh, marital confines are not attributed to the father. So who are they attributed to? Satan? To the mother. Oh. <laughs> so she, because she's committed that act, according to Islam, she doesn't need to pay nothing. Wait, so, really? Yeah, yeah. So we're good. What do you mean? Like, man, I, I'm, I can go with Kamazina. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. What, what no, am I? <laughs> but, but having said that, because of n- new age biological realities, like if he knows for sure this is my child, yeah, he might either want to marry that woman and sanctify the situation and raise a child, or I think it would be right for him to at least do that. But if you talk about technically what scholars of Islam would say, they would, um, they would say there's no relation to wouldn't care about that. So you can, so you're good. But Zina obviously is a major sin, so you should never do that anyway. And well, you wouldn't want, like personally, I wouldn't want another man raising my child, do you know what I mean? Mm. So. Uh, DJ Mal says, can I listen to music in Jana? Uh, the kinds of, the, yani, what kind of music is this? Is, for example, if it, we have to define what music is like. What, most of the scholars that say music is haram. Now, there's a difference of opinion about that. Majority of scholars say music is haram, right? Based on the view that there's a hadith which is, says in Bukhari, mm. there are four things that people will make halal, what is haram, and one of them is ma'azid music. So, majority of scholars of Islam, vast majority, they say that means that music is haram, although there are notable exceptions. For example, Ibn Hazm, huge scholar, he says it's halal, and he says that that hadith is mu'allaq. Al Ghazali, a huge scholar, he has a whole book in Lahay al Din saying it's, yeah, music is not haram. Uh, Shawkani, he has a whole book saying it's not haram. Uh, some scholars from the Shafi school say it's not haram. Uh, the music they're talking about is just any musical instrument. But the majority of scholars say it's haram. There were some scholars from the early generation who actually said that, who believed that music was halal, interestingly, like Ibn Majashun and so on. Interesting. But uh, there are three uh, opinions about music. So, the nasheeds and so on, the voice, if it's with the voice, uh, most scholars allow that because there's nothing wrong with the human voice. If we're talking about the, uh, with the musical instruments and the banjo and the no guitar, more. if I well, and all that kind of stuff, uh, most scholars uh, disallow that. Although the, the Shafi school some allow some instruments and some don't allow some instruments. Uh, so, on your question, there may be some instruments and some music in Jannah which are, which are permissible and allowed and which sound better than anything you've heard in dunya. In the same way as there's, like for example, there's wine in Jannah, but that doesn't create, have all of the negative effects. So it's not going to make you a drunkard? Yeah. But you'll enjoy the taste? Yes. 
Okay. Um, people are also asking, I, I'm curious about this one because within my community, I have a lot of Christians. The question is, should Muslims and Christians put their differences aside and just focus on the greater enemy, which is Satan slash Shaitan? It depends on the issue at hand. So we, we, we wouldn't pray together because we have different ways of praying and we also have different people that we pray to. I mean, we pray to one God, they pray to three. Uh, I mean, effectively, that's what's happened. So we wouldn't, okay, we would say you praying to three God is worse than praying to, it's the same as praying to, you might as well pray to the devil himself because it's, it's kind of, this one policy is for another policy. Is right. I mean, praying to Muhammad is, or praying to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the prophet, or praying to Jesus, or praying to the devil, all of that we would consider to be Polytheist, paganism yeah. and polytheism, right? So, but it also uh, says in the Quran to not debate with the Jews and the Christians. I, I read that for the first time. But it says, "Wala tujadilu ahl al-kitabi illa billati ahsan." Actually, so it says, "Do not d d debate with the Jews or Christians except with the way which is better." Okay. Illa ladina dhalamu minhum. This is chapter like twenty-nine of the Quran. Except for those who have oppressed among them. So, yani, those who are oppressed, we don't even debate them. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to debate them. So, there are some issues which we can com we can combine efforts with Christians. Yes, like the LGBTQ issue, feminist issue, other issues, the, the, the woke issue, many issues, uh, the Palestine issue, other injustices that are happening in the world, whether it be in South Sudan, whether it be in uh, Sudan in general, and now because we're seeing it happening in Sudan, whether it be in Congo, whether it be in any part of the world where there, there's work that needs to be done, Muslims and Christians should come together and work together and put their differences aside for those projects. But when it comes to worship and stuff like that, obviously we have our separate institutions. What about um, free speech absolutism? This is something that I agree with Myron about. Um, mm -hmm. And I understand, it. I want to ask you about this. Being a free speech absolutist is, is an anti-Islamic position because there's some, there you have to draw the line when it, it disrespects or when it um, goes into polytheism and stuff like that. Uh, but when it, I come to curating my community and curating my stream, I do believe in free speech, the same way that people make fun of, like they make fun of Hindus and Pajits, they say all, all the time. Um, so I think should, if, you're, if, if all day long we're gonna make fun of Zionists and, and Pajits, Hindus, then people should be able to make fun of, um, from, of everybody. Mm. Is free speech absolutism, um, is that an anti-Islamic position? Should I not allow everything? Should I like tell the mods to be specific? See, what, what one can say is this. One can say that in Western governments, okay, that we're not making a political case for or against free speech the way you guys do it. Yeah? I'm, I have an agnostic position towards free speech for or against the way you guys do it. Why, why would I say it like that? The way, the way I would say it like that is because of the same reason that you've just mentioned. If, for example, uh, it benefits Muslim communities to have certain laws about free speech and removing those laws could affect the Dawah, could affect certain things, the question about the detriments and the costs are questions that scholars of Islam would have to discuss. Now, in Islamic lands, Islamic lands is different. We're talking about Islamic law. Of course, we don't believe in this. We don't believe in that it's okay to attack Jesus, that it's okay to attack Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to attack any of the prophets, uh, that anybody does it. Because someone could say, well, you have free speech to say whatever you like, yeah? Which means you can mock the prophets. We say, fine. Then uh, why, why stop at uh, free speech to mock the prophets and not free speech to break the law? So for example, you, mm. can, you can mock the prophets, we were, these other guys who are the terrorists, who we, do, who we also disavow, they want to break the law. So just as much as I have an agnostic position about this, you have to worry about those terrorists who are going to attack you if you do this. Because it's not just, and this is, it's no Islamic exceptionalism here. There are certain things that if you say, if you go too far in saying, violence. with any community it can lead to violence. Now if you go to Mexico, if you go to Colombia, if you go to Harlem in New York, if you go to anywhere, and you say certain things against certain races, certain cartels, certain people, certain gangs, certain mafias, certain religious figures, there's going to be a response. Okay. Now, no one is saying you can't say what you want. You can say what you like if you go to those places. If you go to the middle of Harlem, like in Die Hard 3, and have a sign that says, I hate <laughs> you can do that. All yeah. you like. Yeah. Free speech. Now, but someone can say, you know what, I've, I'm very offended by this. I'm going to decide to shoot this guy. Mm -hmm black person says, oh, this is, offends me. And a lot of black people and a lot of feminists, those woke people would defend that and say yeah, that that's a lie. say no problem. Say, I'm saying to shoot him. Uh, he's going to shoot him now. So, 
you don't just have to fear the law when you're when you're saying what you want to say. You right. have to fear the people. So so much as because what is an extension of free speech absolutism is free sp- is anarchy actually. Because if you think about the political spectrum, right? Free speech absolutism is on the way to a kind of anarchical system, at least on a social level. Okay. Yeah. If you if you think about objectively, because the the government is deciding not to get involved in what people say. Okay, so what's one step further than that? One step further than that is to say, well, the government shouldn't get involved in what we'll do either. So that's physicality. So if you want to take a more radical position than free speech absolutism, then you should allow vigilantism, actually. Whether or not you allow it, the vigilantes won't care. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... The terroristic position, which is something which we, do, we must say on the stream, we completely disavow it and we, we are against it. Or the terroristic or the gang position, or let's call it the belligerent position, or whatever it is, which is that if these people's people, my race, my country, my religion, whatever, that's the position, that we will respond in violence and even more than violence. It will be something which we... That position is an extension, actually, of the free speech absolutism position. It's an extension of it. It's actually more... Uh, in the, it, it's more on the side of freedom. And so, if, if someone wanted to push the envelope, why stop there? Vigilantism. So, okay, you want to offend him with your words, he wants to offend you with his violence. It's an extension. So, I say, look, I'm not against it. I'm not making a legal case. I don't care what the Americans do with their law. Mm-hmm. With, with all due respect, who am I? Who am I to go and tell the Americans to put this law into place and... and what effect will my protestation have on whether the Americans decide to put this law or the Europeans decide to put well, that Well, what about in the UK? I see some criticism more from, I, I would say, the Christian whites in the UK, the, the fact that Islam is growing so fast uh, in the UK. And I even saw some statistic, I say like 30, I'm not sure if it's real, saying like 32% of UK Muslims want Sharia law. And they're getting afraid, like UK is losing its soul. You know, they, UK culture is drinking a pint on the corner and watching the football match and then beating up a Manchester City fan. That's UK culture. It's getting drunk with the lads, going out, and then, you know, that's, and Islamic culture does not really coexist with that idea of... Um, yeah, that's, that's more of a conservative position, actually, if you think about it. Because, it, and when I say conservative position, I'm talking about British conservatism. Mm-hmm. Because British conservative, like, which was promulgated by someone like Edmund Burke. There's a guy called Edmund Burke in the 80s, uh, 1800s, 1900s. People like him. These conservatives, they, they basically want to hold on to tradition. Okay? So uh, the question is, at what point do we start the clock? Because let's say, for example, I, I as a, let's say, aristocrat Englishman, want to start the clock in the year 1650, uh, where, it was, where Shakespeare's works were fresh, where, you know, I don't know, you know, Jamesian, you know, the King James Version has just come, uh, of the Bible has just come out, and I want to use that language. Someone says, no, we want to push it a little further to the 1800s. We want to bring those traditions and cultures back. Someone pushes it further to the less 1950s, right before the sexual revolution, before the feminist. Who gets to decide to start the clock when and where and, uh, and how? But what I find contradictory is that the same right-wing people who attack um, people who attack, uh, who, who, are, who are, let's say, free speech absolutists. Yeah. Who, who in a sense, are arguing for a liberal position when it comes to free speech, that they also want a conservative reality. So, because look, mm. think about it. If you, if, you want a, if you want a society of 80 million people, well, let's say 70 million people, right, in Britain, you want a society to have free speech. That's the right-wing position. You're, you're speaking about free speech now. We see in most of the outlets, GB News, Talk TV. Somewhat, yeah. Yeah, we do see. They're speaking about free speech all the time, yeah? So if that's what you want, you want free speech. But at the same time, you're telling us that society is being corrupted by freedom of expression and speech. Isn't that a contradiction? Right. <laughs> well, so, I mean, they're saying it freedom of speech, but also the invasion of, like, they call it the um, so Muslim you, invasion. Don't, don't, don't say freedom of speech. Say selective freedom of speech. Say, I want white freedom of speech, then. Mm. I don't like black freedom because they attack the carnival. Like, you know, the Jamaicans have this thing in the carnival. Yeah. And it, had, it has to be attacked, actually, because some of the things they it's do... It's disgusting. Yeah. That's the part where people are like, don't make fun of culture. Like, don't... 
disrespect Jamaican culture. If their country, culture is like getting naked and humping each other in the streets. And, and that's, that's only recent, by the way. Uh, I don't know, maybe th I used to watch this. Uh, the, the carnival, maybe about 15 years ago, wasn't like that. Only recently, the gangs have started to come out. These guys have started, they're making a, a mockery out of it. I think carnival, like when my dad was growing up, uh, Haiti um, yeah. has a similar one. It wasn't the way it is now. Yes, exactly. You see all the streamers are going there to Jamaica. They're, they're pretty much just like almost having sex in the exactly. street. It's disgusting. It's you know, and, the, and then if you ever criticize it, like this is Jamaican culture. No, it's I not. mean, shouldn't you, like we yeah. should, I mean, if there were cannibals in a certain culture, <laughs> yeah, we yeah. would say, hey, maybe you should not be eating each other. This is, your culture is wrong of cannibalism. And I personally love Jamaica. Making culture, I like the food, I like everything. Bomba clad, yeah. Well, bomba clad, you know. <laughs> biakan, you know, it is, you don't you don't eat a biakan. Don't know. Yeah, you don't know. But well, so we all are affected in England by uh, Jamaican culture. So, but it's as I say, if, if this if this you want to, that's actually a besmirchment of uh, Jamaican culture. I think this uh, carnival recently what I've seen because I it's like a live, parody. Of I it. live it. I live in the area where the carnival carnival happens. I see people coming out with knife and this and that, bro. Like you know, don't yeah. tell me it's a Jamaican culture because <laughs> now you're besmirching uh, the Jamaican culture. Yeah. But what I'm saying is. Uh, the point I'm making is, uh, you know, if you want free speech and expression, if that's what you're calling for, yeah, okay, don't complain about the results of that. If the results of that are Muslim people coming into the country, people converting to Islam, then that is the results of what you've called for. You yeah. can't have that and you're not right. have that at the same time. And people get really upset, like, do you see the videos of one Ummah? Uh, getting like white kids to take shahada and like, yeah. that, that really makes them upset and I don't even think it's like a religious issue I think it's a racial issue the fact that they're seeing like brown people convert their white yeah, people and then you see in the comments deport 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 yeah, 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 yeah. deport what a British citizen so yeah. next who's going to be deported you because you're going to set a precedent for a brown people to be deported then you're going to have something which goes against the state and then you're next I, I, I didn't I didn't realize how strong um Islam I don't like that word Islamophobia because it sounds like homophobia or transphobia mm -hmm. but I, I didn't realize how stigmatized that was mm. i was from the perception that people saw the um, the good in islam it's like what's the alternative you know it seems like everything that muslims stand for is all the principles of islam are really good for society mm. so I, I, the fact that it gets these people that upset it's not a it's not a moral issue it's a it's a racial one they don't like to see there but you have to you know there's you have to empathize with them a little yeah. bit yeah. So, you know, growing up with the James Bond and Wayne Rooney's dominating and then now seeing it change to the way it is, it's got to hurt. It, it does go out, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, you, you wanted to take this much money from the rest of the world through colonialism. Mm -hmm. Now you've called these guys back over to help fix your country after the 1950s and 60s. Mm -hmm. They fix your country, we're going to come to go get out. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean... This is exactly what happened, right? You had World War One and Two. Um, why are these Pakistanis and these Bengalis and these Jamaicans? What are they doing in England? They're doing that because the English people wanted them in there to fix their country. Mm -hmm. So now that they've done that, you can't complain about the results of this. They're here. They're here. What are we going to do with them? It's a reality. Unless you want to become a fascist state, like you want to become like Hitler and Nazi Germany, and say, look, we only allow this race here. You, and we're gonna, we have a Muslim problem, we're going to get rid of them. Unless you want to go down that route, which you can't say you believe in that and freedom of expression at the same time. Because that is against freedom of expression. What was, do you know what Hitler's position was on Islam? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I've heard some people say recently that, they, that Hitler respected Islam, but I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know. I mean, he, There's a lot of misinformation. I personally there. believe that if Muslims lived in his state, they'd probably, he'd probably do the same thing with them. You know? there, were no, there were no like... Muslim, significant Muslim population in Germany at the time. Most people talk about that, uh, they talk about the Mufti and uh, Hitler and that little meeting they had. And they're trying to say that they connect it with the, the fact that, okay, well, you know, how, how could he meet with the Mufti of Palestine at the time? I mean, Mufti mm -hmm. I mean. He also met with the Irgun, or at least he done, he, the Nazi party had connections with the then Jewish uh, parties who would make up the state of Israel, like the Irgun, for example. Mm -hmm. And they both they co collaborated on getting the Jews out of Germany because they both have a common um, objective. And that's mentioned in peer-reviewed journals. So if you say, okay, well, Hitler had this connection with the Mufti of Jerusalem. He also had, a, the Nazi party also had a connection with the Jewish parties as well. They did. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know exactly what Hitler's position was on Islam, but it wouldn't matter because he had his own thing. And he believed in the Aryan race. He believed that the white man was best. He believed in. Is that true? Yeah, of course he did. Yeah, I, I never saw a speech where he was talking about that. Well, eugenics and stuff. 
I, it was mostly about like nationalism in Germany, stuff like that. I didn't see, I, I couldn't find like, like speeches. S- yeah. I couldn't find solid information about the, um, about whites being the supreme race. I think there is. I think because they had eugenics programs and stuff. The, the blue eyes and the white skin and stuff mm-hmm. like that. There's, they did have. There's a lot of that. Well, speaking about Hitler, mm-hmm. um, where do you think the the future of this this Israeli Palestine issue? Where is that going to go? I got some some heat, but I was I saw that they attacked the um, the Iran consulate in Syria. I, I said um, I tweeted, "We stand with Iran," and a lot of people got really upset. I got calls from like Americans saying like, "Oh, like don't say this. You're in Saudi Arabia." Oh, okay. Or Americans saying like, "Oh, Iran's the enemy." All this stuff. I was just, you know, the fact that they got bombed by by the IDF um, and the consulate in Syria. But where do you think that this is going? And and how does this? Uh, I didn't get to ask you this like too extensively in London. But how does this relate to to the end times? That's something that um, the Love Speech community is always talking about: is the um, the coming of the Dajjal and you know the red heifer and stuff like this. Where do, where do you foresee the, the future of the Israeli conflict? Some people are saying that Iran is going gonna, is gonna to fight them now. Um, I don't think they will. I, I think Iran is quite strategically um, cautious, actually. They, they've got two or three pawns. They've got the Hezbollah, they've got the Houthis, and they've also got other, you know, in a way they're connected with Hamas, in a way. So I don't think it would make sense for Iran to risk being invaded by the United States of America by striking Israel. If they did that, it would be unprecedented in their cautious strategic decision making in the last 20 or 30 years. Mm-hmm. They have never done anything like that. And, they, I, and because that gives America all the legitimacy in the world to go and attack Iran. Right. So I don't think they're that silly, unless they had the backing of China and, and or Russia, like the explicit pact backing of them. So I don't think, I think this is just, um, I think this is just PR. PR for who? For the, I th- the Houthis and the, and the Iranians have, have really shot up in, popul- in popularity recently in the Muslim world. So their fiery speeches and their attacks and their threats. Even though they're Shia. Yeah. There have been times in the, in the history of like the Middle East where the Hezbollah and the Iranians and the Houthis have have shot up in popularity and this is one of those times especially Hamas came up recently and them and the Islamic Jihad which are the number two uh, kind of faction in, uh, in, in Palestine both of which explicitly praised Iran for what? Um, for, for their stance uh, you know on the issue of Palestine mm-hmm. they, 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 they praised Iran they praised Yemen and they praised um, Hezbollah. They, so this is a Sunni group, Hamas, praising three different. I know Shia. Hezbollah is, is comprised of Shia, and is yeah. Yemen comprised of Shia too? Yeah, yeah but it's a different kind of Shia. This, the, the Yemeni ones are the we call Zaydi Shiites, which are much closer to Sunnis. So uh, people are also asking this question: like, what's the, um, like, why are so many Shia? Why it seem like Shias are backing Palestine more than any Sunni nations or any Sunni factions? I think political reasons. I mean, don't forget what's happened in the last twenty or thirty years is unprecedented. It's it's um, it's to do with how America has played the game and how they've allied with certain Muslim countries, mm-hmm. including the one they're in right now. Yeah. So, I think that that is probably uh, the reason. And so, after the the Islamic Revolution in nineteen seventy nine. In Iran, mm-hmm. Iran became much more alienated in the you know in the Middle East, so they've had to they've had to strategically kind of um, depend or let's say depend on on China and Russia in a much more more so China in a much stronger way than the West. What was the, that? I remember reading a book about that, but I can't remember now. So it was it like it was a clash with liberalism in Iran in 1979. What, what was that revolution? So this was a, what you had before. You had the person called the Shah, and um, this was a Western puppet, you know, at the time in Iran. He was disposed. Actually, he ran. He he exiled to Egypt. He, uh, he you know he ran and hid there. And um, at the time, Khomeini, who was this figure of the Shiites, he was in his, his, of all places France. And he went from France. He came back to Iran. And he led this revolution, and it was they've created this system now where uh, it's a parliamentary system, but it has at the top of it this you know the religious figure. 
Before it was called Khomeini, now the guy's called Khamenei. You know, and um, they've, also, they've also got a pr- prime minister. So before it was Ahmadinejad. I forget the name of the guy now. Ahmadinejad was the famous guy who said that you know he, we want to erase Israel from the map and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's very interesting because Iran is a country which, for the last twenty to thirty years, have had the most apostates from Islam than any other country in the world. Why is that? And I think part of the reason why that is the case is because of the government. Because they, they were seen, and whether this is true or not, this is a discussion, separate discussion. But I think that they were seen by their population, by large swathes of the population, as very repressive. Very, like, overly claustrophobic level repressive. And I think that that made people rebel in their mind, psychological rebellion. Uh, to a point we've never seen it before. So, I mean, the, the, they've had a war with Iraq. Iran had a war in the 80s with Iraq. But in terms of combat, like one-on-one combat uh, with any other nation, Iran really hasn't... They've used their pawns. They've used Hezbollah. They've used the, uh, the Houthis. They've used other people. But they have not necessarily engaged in the last 10, 15 years themselves directly in any conflict. And they've been quite cautious strategically. So I don't think... Unless they have a dramatic change... But for them to have a dramatic change, there'd have to be some real thing that they're going to win from this. Mm-hmm. And I don't think they'd be willing to risk this just for a PR victory. So um, Iran will speak, the t- they will talk the talk, but I don't think they'll walk the walk. So the hype is not justified. I don't think so. I don't think Iran will do it. Hezbollah could do, because they're just literally on the borders. Mm-hmm. And, but they will also be cautious, and they have been cautious. So they'll do certain things, but they won't go too far. Though. They'll play a cautious game they realize the enemy is quite strong and the enemy realizes they're quite strong so it's a stalemate at the moment they'll do like skirmishes I don't think they want to go further than that but it's it's more than anyone else is doing so you think in order for Iran to really do something it's going to result in World War 3 pretty much because China is going to need to get involved I don't think so because I don't think China would get involved I don't think they would protect them I don't think they'll protect them. Why? Because it's what they got to what they got to gain from that. Not China and China is not the country that would make the big difference because China needs America. They're in an interdependent economic relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't think they'd be willing to you know risk that for to sacrifice that for this. Uh, no, I don't think so. It would be Russia that would be the key player, I think. But I don't think they'd get involved either. But Russia is has got a lot more to gain because they're in war with Ukraine and stuff like that mm-hmm. from weakening the West. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just don't see, I don't, I, don't see um, I don't see it being in the interest of anyone to expand the war to a regional conflict. And I think America knows that. Yeah. And what about the, what about the end times? Is, is there any, what do you know about the red heifer stuff like that? Because people, they... Yeah, so the red heifer thing, I mean, that is, it's legitimate in the sense that, okay, this is some verses in the book of Numbers, and these guys actually believe in it. The Jews actually believe in it, or some Jews believe in it. The red it. cow, by the way. The red cows that they've gotten from Texas, and they've flown over for $500,000, and uh, they're going to slaughter them tomorrow after tomorrow I don't know three yeah, or four days from now coming up yeah yeah. and uh, the Temple Institute you know the uh, in Israel they're saying once that ceremony has been done they want to replace Masjid al-Aqsa mm-hmm. with their own temple the, th- the second temple of Solomon um, and I was reading in the Quran uh, Masjid al-Aqsa is actually really is more significant than I thought it's one of the this is the top three yes yeah very significant now, if Masjid al-Aqsa, this is a real question now, if Masjid al-Aqsa is attacked and destroyed, which is a possibility, uh, or attacked by the Israelis, would that create global up- uprisings throughout the Muslim world? I think in some countries it may do. It could create rebellion. Which countries? Jordan. Because half of the um, population is Palestinian. What about Lebanon? Possibly. They're, the, they're the, I would say, the high alert countries. Uh, Jordan and Lebanon. I don't think it would do so. As, as bad as it may sound, I don't think it would do so in Egypt. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it... I think that now we're talking Iran, Hezbollah and all those guys. 
uh, there's a, about four or five countries that could end up deciding to go pretty hard on on Israel if they do that. But not Egypt. Why? They're I don't think it's, it's the the size of the population. Your I, country, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that because a lot of the the worry is that if Egypt gets involved in a conflict with Israel, that the, so many people will die. Like if we're saying thirty thousand people is a lot, Egypt's got one hundred ten million people. So people are going to say, well, the, even the population. I think a lot of them will think, is it worth it? I think even the population will think that. Wow. But I think a, a huge chunk of the population will say it is worth it. So that you'd have a, an issue on your hands throughout the whole Muslim world. If, it depends on what they do with it. If they desecrate it, that's one thing. If they destroy it and try and put the temple on top of it, I think in many ways that could be the, the catalyst for something massive to happen in the Muslim world. Massive, like a complete change. And then America will no longer be in control. Because... I, America wouldn't want that to happen. Because right now they've got the, con the situation under control to a certain extent. If, that, if something like that happens, it creates a new impetus, a new catalyst. So I, mm, it's, it's a really, it's a toss up. It depends on what kind of images we see. I don't know, I, I really do. I think that might be the event that is required, something as significant as that, for there to be some kind of a new uh, phase. So this is uh, this era in history is, is going to be really defining. I think so. Yes, I think I really will. One of the things I want to do, I want to do a series on eschatology. I just want to go through all the minor signs and all the hadiths and go through like exactly where the because the, there's hadiths which mention specific locations, and I really want to see what what's going to happen because you think you can predict it based on the hadith? No. no, no one can predict the times and dates, but we can get a better idea. We can get a good, really good idea. Like, do you know what I mean? I haven't seen a good breakdown on that. That'd be interesting. That would be nice, you know, if we could do that. But, I mean, you guys can donate right now. I think we're, we're almost at 100000 I want to check the website now. Yes. Project Iftar. Must feel um, so good that you were able to do that. It does feel really good. Yeah, it? in, a, in a selfish way, like, yeah, yeah I'm really happy <laughs> about that. Well, I think it's, it's, a good sell, it's, it's good to be selfish about something like that. No, oh, that's fantastic, bro. I've been doing this for a long time as well, you know, the, the, the charity stuff. and it's My well, first time. You know, it, and it feels good because it's like... No, and no one can deny that, okay, your platform is being used. Is it always on now? Is that what? What is it on now? Yeah, it's just showing the, showing the counter. Ooh, I want to see okay, what it's yeah. at. Yeah, oh, yeah but nobody can right. deny. But again, No one can deny that's good for humanity, bro. No one can deny. Even I mean, I got some detractors. Some people are like, oh, he's so arrogant, he can't even give his own money. I'm like, well, you Come think on. I would, you know, it's just. Come on. It's a slow counter. I don't know why it's so slow. Oh, but good. Yeah, projectiftar.org slash Nico. Do you have any, um, any charities or anything that you want to... I have, but I fatigued the guys by... I did the same thing. I don't know how much we raised. But I think it's over. I don't know. If I add it all together, I'll have one add it up and it's over. But is it what you got now? The, see, the original goal for the beginning <laughs> of Ramadan was 60,000. We, we smashed that. Okay, so That's now, awesome. I don't know if it's updated yet, but now we're at 91,000. I think before the end of Eid, Eid is three days, correct? Not this one. No? This one's one day. Just one day? Yeah. Oh, it's going to be tough. <laughs> it's going to be tough. It would be nice to get to $100,000 for, for this Ramadan. I think that was very successful. Again, really happy with the community. And I saw the, did you see some of the footage of, of um, I want to show you, yeah. of the kids we were feeding. Um, I don't really get emotional often, but seeing that like made me... Oh, wow. These, the project is Iftar. It, has it got your thing on it? Yeah, wow. Project Iftar from, this is in Gaza. Uh, we weren't public about Gaza in the beginning because we didn't want the website to get shut down, but we just said it was like Pakistan, Sierra so Leone. That is, do you know, this is really good because it shows the food is actually coming in. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's good to see like actually the, the kids eating from it. I'm, I'm showing Muhammad a job, but I, the footage is online. That's really good, bro. Yeah. Amazing. And they look like they, they need it, bro. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, they look, they look They're skinny. desperate for it, man. Yeah. But this is what you guys are doing, and it's something that's objectively good. There's no denying that. Um, very happy about that. Muhammad Ajab, thank you. Uh, Kiam just ended, so I think, um, I think this is good. Oh, you're getting to, I'm seeing you getting some phone calls. Wait, come in. Come on. I want to say thank you to, uh, to, to Muhammad here. I just found him on the street. <laughs> I just found him on the street. I was praying next to his little brother yesterday, and I was looking for a cameraman because uh, Needles, you know, he's Christian. He, Where are you from? He's South Africa. South Africa. Which part? How do you know? Uh, Janice, but he's, uh, he's excellent. Very beautiful, beautiful country, bro. Have you been there before? 
No, I haven't been to South Africa. Beautiful. Invite me, bro. Beautiful. Okay, we'll go, we'll go. It is one of the most beautiful countries you ever go to in your life. Really? It's not dangerous at all? There's nothing with problems with it? It is dangerous. It is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, it's not. Go with the right people, Ooh, though. Yo, to have fun, but you yeah. have to go Cape Town and China. Oh, Cape Town. Oh. Well, why did you go to South Africa? I had the lectures and stuff there. You came? I came, of course. I came, brother. By which message you went in China as well? So many, like maybe at least uh, 50 messages. Did you like come that. to Russian? I think I did, yeah. For real? I think I did, honestly. I'll find out. That's so cool. You should come also. Well, honestly, you would love it. I would love to go. You would love it. Yeah. It's nature, it is beautiful. And the Muslim community is very powerful there. Bro. Yo, very powerful. Especially in, in China's body in Cape Town. Yeah. And also, Chad, I want to see what you think. Uh, so, Mohammed invited me to spend Eid with his family. Because Eid is a celebration you're supposed to spend with your family. Like yeah. going to different houses in the neighborhood and doing all that. But I have zero Muslim family. So, I think it'd be good to, uh, to do that. I want to see what they think if I should if I should um, if I should do it. Yeah, absolutely. Bro. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna celebrate Eid with all your family in there, bro. Yeah. In in Medina, There's yeah. all one family. So we're gonna. That's true. You know. You don't live too far away. Uh no. Okay, perfect. They're saying next stream in South Africa. They're saying W. <laughs> so yes, do it. You should come. Yeah. Oh, even um. Uh, okay, cool. Oh, and fifty dollars from. From someone. By the way, when you do the super chats, it goes to oh Warner. Have no fear, the Warner is here. <laughs> <laughs> Warner, what's up, man? We miss you. He said, Hijab, you killed it on Fresh and Fit. Proud of you, my brother. May Allah continue to bless both you guys. What's Warner, up? we miss you. I hope you have a good Eid uh, back in Shaitan land of Los Angeles. Oh my God. Um, we're spending it out here. What have you got planned for the rest of the day? For the rest of uh, you're gonna spend spending Eid here? Probably so, actually. Probably so. You should also come. Say no more. Send me your details, I'll come. And I, uh, His phone wasn't working because Saudi WhatsApp something is on. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll figure it all out. That'd be really um, good. What have you got planned for the rest of the night? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have a little nap, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I Probably, mean, uh, maybe a little nap. A little nap? It's almost yeah. I don't want to end. I know I'm going to. I'm going to take the. I'm going to go IRL walk around a little bit. If you guys are yeah. in Medina, come say hi to me. Just let me plug in my phone. Mohammed Ajab. Thank you so much, bro. Have a good rest. I appreciate it. Too, and um, this was a great Ramadan. And it was I, fantastic. I, I want to give a lot of credit to you. Like, the hospitality in London was, was next level. Thank uh, you so thank much. Thank you so much thank from the bottom so of my heart. Bro. I mean, we want to appreciate it. No, we'll, we'll do better next time. No, that, that was stupendous. It was, you made it a great. I'm actually missing London. It's like, this Ramadan has been so great. Like, I want, like, recapping the whole thing. Live stream has ended, bro. I, I want to bring up uh, uh, Jordan Peterson. Okay. Let's see what, what he's doing right now. I forget. Let it go. Oh. He was changing his uh, camera to phone. Okay. There's this podcast has end here. Okay. Goodbye, assalamu alaikum. I think you got lots of knowledge from it. You, you got, yeah, inshallah, we'll do better in the future, inshallah. Eid Mubarak, assalamu alaikum, everyone.